Welcome to episode 240 of the Overlook Hour. I'm your host, Clark Little. Along with me, as always, is the man who is now, as I've just been told, standing up. It's Randy Michaelstead. Yes, sir. Welcome to uh, episode 240. If you mix those uh, around, you get 420. So, oh, you're delivering. What dude. is <laughs> happening today? Randy, you stand up and all the blood run to your butthole. And you guys are the one that are on weed, not me. <laughs> yes, Grandpa. <laughs> also joining us is Russell John Fisher and Oksana Valerian of Anamada Osachi. I'm only on 2.5 milligrams. And... Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. I'm so sorry. Rusty John Fisher. Oh, is yeah. Here. <laughs> yeah, shout out. <laughs> Shout out to Scarred for Life podcast. Uh, oh, that gave me... I mean, it's my own fault. That gave me so much joy. If I wasn't gripped with anxiety... That, <laughs> I think we talked about it before on the last episode, but yeah. The minute I got in front of that camera, I just went blank. I mean, hear me out. Uh, okay, I'm turning if you If I were to call you Rusty now... Oh, I hate... You know what? It's only because one dude in my life who I'm not very fond of. He's yeah. an older uncle uh, car salesman kind of guy. Oh, Not my uncle, like a friend's uncle. Sounds oh, like dude, he cool was like, hey, what's up, Rusty? I'm like, oh, I fucking. <laughs> and it's not because I didn't like the name. You know what I mean? Rusty Nails. It's a horror icon. Uh, but, uh, Randy, what do you think? Do you think Russ can uh, transition to Rusty? I think so. It's not bad. Oh, I, I that worries me. Oksana, you're not a fan of Rusty. Not at all, no. Right. She's the boss. So, <laughs> <sighs> joining us on episode 240 of the Overlook Hour is Zeke Farrow, uh, director, star, writer of Possessions, which is a short film that we played at the Unnamed Footage Festival fundraiser for Forgotten Film Footage Films. Uh, happy to have Possessions as a part of that. Uh, as we talk about this in the actual interview. This may or may not have been billed as Possessions 2, uh, erroneously by us. Uh, we kind of go into that towards the end of the interview and how that sort of happened, uh, which is kind of Zeke's fault, and it's kind of our fault. What are you going to do? I just read what the cue card says. That's literally how that happens. I wrote that cue card, so it's my fault. All right. <laughs> Um, but uh, Possession was a great film and uh, Zeke's uh, got a bunch of films out on, is all his shorts available on Vimeo, Russ, is that correct? Not all of them. I, uh, Possessions actually isn't available yet either. Yes, that's correct. He does have a couple though, if you look for him. Um, the minute that comes out, we'll we'll share it and put it out there. I think it should be the end of this month. I don't know, he talks yeah. about it in the interview. Uh, th yeah, great talk. Uh, Zeke's a blast, man. So, yeah, he's uh, a fucking character. Yeah. That dude rules. Have, have fun with that. Uh, but before we get to all that uh we need to cover what's coming out theatrically and on video on demand and we do that with oksana valerian of Anamana osachi and here is her new theme song to this segment a s w a n g ass wang do you just randomly click buttons that's when you correct do that? <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> Um, so the first one I will talk about is going to be coming to VOD Friday the 9th. It's called A Common Crime. I believe it's um, it's Ar Argentinian. Mm. Um, the rural juror. <laughs> Cecilia is a social, or sorry, a psychology teacher. Sociology. Sociology there teacher. There we go. One night, the son of her maid desperately knocks on her door and she doesn't open. The next day, Kevin's body shows up murdered by the police. Cecilia begins to <laughs> Cecilia begins to be haunted by the young man's ghost. Um, what? <laughs> Can you reread that like a regular person? No. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I love the cover though. As it, it looks like unsane. In the membrane. Yeah. Unsane <laughs> in the membrane. That's good. <laughs> yeah, all the stills from it look really good. Um... I believe we got an email about this. Otherwise, I I haven't seen anyone. We got a screener. I'll have to double check. If we do, you've I hide, you've been hiding screeners. Oh, bro? dude, we've been we've been getting so many emails. I haven't even opened the fucking thing in a while. None. Like, look you at know, that poster. If you were emailing about the podcast, though, I would we would know because I'll at least look at the preview. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, all the movies. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't checked them out. 
This looks rad, though. I like the idea of a social. Soci I can't talk either. Boy, y'all are <laughs> y'all are y'all are paired Sociology together. teacher. I didn't even take any edibles. <laughs> um, no, but you probably got a vat of wine you've been using as an IV drip over there. <laughs> the next day, Kevin's body shows up, murdered by the police. That's such a weird. Implic like who That's like what... do we know Kevin? <laughs> like what? I just assumed it was the guy knocking on her door. Like Yeah, I don't there's a lot of assumptions going on in that setup. This might be a weirdly uh maybe weirdly translated Oh, it's Argentinian. Yeah. I don't know. Um... Un crime de common I don't I added up. <laughs> Man. Wait, you know out. you do There it. goes you our do. show. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Gee whiz. <laughs> Try it. You you give it a shot. Hell of a run we had. <laughs> no. Oh yeah, that's what's gonna end this. Me me not being able to say a common crime and it's, what is that? I'm talking know. about coming on crime, dude. I don't know what you're doing. All right, what's the next movie? <laughs> uh, the next one is Voyagers. Oh, this looks good. Which will also be coming out on Friday the ninth. Um, a crew of astronauts on a multi generational mission descend into paranoia and madness not knowing what is real or not now this is written and directed by neil berger not to be confused oh. with neil hamburger <laughs> oh then i don't want to watch it yeah man if this would be written and directed by neil hamburger all right That's what I'm talking about. so randy's gonna watch it and then we'll ask him the radiant he'll say oh three. bro i'm gonna watch this I'm no it's space this, dude you hate space but i love colin farrell nah, so the, no. the pendulum see you gotta My stop love... going through the pictures no 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 i know i saw this trailer with you you nah. didn't you, no nah. yeah bitch. play before you nobody when we all went yes. you didn't see this trailer yeah. because you were busy green crypto town i um i am a fan of classical critics and siskel and ebert used to always talk about how trailers are the worst thing that ever happened to film and they would get up and march out until they were done you were on your phone like an <laughs> asshole i was trading crypto like a tight ass digital nomad i think i stopped watching this trailer because the movie looks really good and i wanted to see it and trailers show you way too much it yeah. looks fucking hack town no dude it looks like <laughs> Look spring at color. It's, dude it's spring breakers in space it dude. looks like 80s in space bro I also yeah. don't think it looks good, but I do want to see it. <laughs> yeah. I think it looks good. I love it when me and Randy are on the Dude, same side. Dude, you got Ty that, Sheridan. Whose son is that? That's not his son. That's Ty Sheridan. What? He looks like someone. Yeah, he's been famous since he was a zygote. A Q-goat? Ty Sheridan was in Tree of Life. Ty, Ty Sheridan, Sheridan was in Mud. <laughs> Ty Sheridan was in a movie I talked about a few months ago that's not great. All right. Ty Dye Sheridan was in Mud, but let's move on. He was in uh, that Steven Spielberg movie about the uh, video games and the Ready world. Player One. There you go. Oh, I watched that movie. I didn't see any of those. Wait, what? How did I watch it and you didn't? Oh, he's in Joe? Yep. Dude. Ready Player One? Why would I watch, dude, watch that hack Ty shit Sheridan you? kills it, dude. Oh, I think that was an airplane movie I watched. What? Ready Player One. Ready Player One? Yeah, it was dumb. Oh, because everyone started messaging the Overlook on Instagram saying, you're going to be famous. Oh, yeah, because Overlook <laughs> Theater. All right. The theaters and... <laughs> Next Fucking movie. Dumb. Um, the next one um, is the Canyonlands, Ooh. which has. A, <laughs> I like this poster. I don't like the name. Yeah, no, the name's not great. This makes me think of the Candylands. What about the canyons? <laughs> oh, great the, picture. Yeah, yeah. Trader, uh, yeah. Uh, your boy. Yep. Um, What's his deal? What's his name? Do you remember? Brett Easton Ellis. Oh, yeah. Don't, hey, have on, you, man. hold on. Have you seen The Funnier Die with um, Huey Lewis and Weird Al? No. Where they're doing American Psycho? No. And it's Huey Lewis is playing uh, Christian Bale's role. And Weird Al is the date. Really? Yeah, dude. I'd watch that. Uh, you know, can you make a note? I'll put that in the show notes. How old it's, is that? It's great because they're talking about the movie American Psycho. Nice. Yeah, it's dude, it's good. I don't know how old it is. It's probably really old. Yeah. But it popped up on because I started watching Funny or Die shit. I feel very ashamed. Yikes. I know it's fucking What's going, on? What's going on with you, dude? You're micro dozing for the show. <laughs> You're watching Funny or Die. I know. What have I turned you into? I'm becoming you. It's if horrible. you watched Isolation, I wore glasses the no, whole time. No, Randy, do you know what I watched last night? I've, I've not through it yet, but Porn I started out. this. Um, I'm going to say it's a public education uh, funded project. That was probably on uh, Pennsylvania public TV in the mid to early 1980s. 
and it's called the diners of pennsylvania and they do a tour of all the diners in the state of pennsylvania and it is riveting oxana next movie is, did you fall asleep to that or? it's two hours long oh, Jesus. oh okay so the longer or lands. shorter than bad band pandemic <laughs> shorter. longer barely or longer. longer i mean <laughs> yeah well how long is it six inches <laughs> <laughs> that's a lie okay let's go so um after five people win a rafting trip down <laughs> five... sign me up would you like me to read these yeah please be... go for it after five people win a rafting trip down the colorado in utah the colorado's a river their adventure takes a deadly turn when they camp off the river for the night and find out that they aren't the only ones out in the remote, rugged canyon lands. Yeah, clearly Rob Zombie's there. <laughs> Look at that trailer. <laughs> that guy looks great. Also, dude, I don't, Luke, you win, five people win a rafting trip? That sounds like a I love punishment. It. No, like I would love it. I love rafting. I I would whitewater raft every day Why's for it the be rest white? of my life. Cause if let me tell you something, if you're if you're rafting in black water, oh, black you got water. you got big problems. Right? That's the song. Oh, look at that poster, better. They do oh, rafting in uh, Flint, Michigan. Oh man, that is that is not a rapid you want to get anywhere near. Dude, you. let's go, let's go, let's do it. I want to take a kayak. Was a kayak or a... raft? Okay, rafting okay. and kayak is two very <laughs> okay. different things. I want to ride a raft down Utah. Have you have you never been rafting? I've never been to Utah. I want to do both. Well, Utah's not the only place where you walk by raft. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kayaked one time, but I'm, I'm I, unraveling. I'm sorry. I love. I, I grew up like kayaking no rivers, man. I don't like it. I miss it. I was wearing a, a thumb ring though at the time, and my finger <clears throat> got so swollen. What are you, Liberace? <laughs> it was years ago. <laughs> like that gay guy Liberace. That's a good song. That's from White Boys. Remember when you watched that movie and loved it? It's pretty good. Eleven percent on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's I love it. The, All right. The last movie I'll mention is coming to VOD and DVD oh, Tuesday the thirteenth. This movie's gotten enough play on this show. Thank you very much. Honey do. Honey do. Even though Clark says it's a honey don't. Honey don't. <laughs> <laughs> um. So that's going to be coming out on Tuesday the thirteenth. Strange cravings and hallucinations befall a young couple after seeking shelter in the home of an aging farmer and her peculiar son. Spoiler alert, the cameo in this movie oh, geez, so is... Nope. Randy, should I spoil it? No. No. Who? I didn't give a fuck. If I was listening to this thing and you said that bitch's name, I'd be like, who? Okay. She's just a girl, dude. I I'm... still don't know who, why she's famous. <laughs> Look, she's just a girl. All right, I'll say it. The it's cameo, a bunch of girls. The cameo you know? is uh, Sherry Moon Zombie. <laughs> <laughs> that honestly, that would be more shocking that she appeared in somebody else's movie. Yeah, that is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that'd be a hell of a cameo. You'd be like, oh shit. Yeah, that would be shocking. That'd be good. All right. For any questions, queries, concerns, or comments, please direct those at podcast at overlooktheater.com. Stitcher, Google Play, iTunes, the other one. Find us, like us, comment, tell a friend, tell an enemy. It's not even my business what you do on your own personal time. The Overlook Hour is available on Facebook as The Overlook Hour. The Overlook Hour is available on YouTube as The Overlook Theater. The Overlook Hour is available on Instagram as The Overlook Theater. And The Overlook Hour is available on Twitter as The Overlook Hour. Find us, like us, comment, tell a friend, tell an enemy. Randy? If you are interested into uh, what Brett Easton Ellis has been up to, he is uh, on Patreon now. You called him Breston. <laughs> Brett <laughs> Easton Ellis. How many patrons he got? What's he pulling down a month over there? Uh, you got a $2 a month, you got a 5 or you got a 10 I'm doing it. Does it not say how much he said? Because sometimes they'll list how many patrons they have and how much a month they bring in. You can actually look that info up. Haven't seen. Oh, some, not worth some, it. Some will display it. All right. Anyway, I hope uh, I hope he's doing well in his harem of young men that he grooms. <laughs> I wish he would let me in. We can and, talk about uh, context film. Enjoy Zeke. Enjoy the show. And we'll see you next week. Randy, take her home. We already did that. Someone 
knocked at the door, and there was no one there. It was coming from the closet. What? Wow, that was really um, succinct. No? The sentence on my cue with the thunder. Uh, both. Thank you. You, you were A+. Plus. Uh, I was kind of waiting for more. I'm so used to people really abusing the format. Randy, how's my thunder drops? It was maybe a little too early. Oh. I feel like I could have used a little, just a little, like, another millisecond there. All right, how about this? Randy, I'm going to redo it just for you, okay? Here okay, go. let's go. Someone knocked at the door and there was no one there. It was coming from the closet. Fuck Randy. <laughs> how about that, Randy? It's good. It builds tension. Oh, he, he left. He uh... Dude, he walked out. <laughs> Double birds in the air, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh no no i'm looking at this though someone knocked at the door and there was no one there it was coming from the closet i feel like that doesn't that's not if you're in the closet why are you knocking no it? <laughs> no i just opened the door i just feel like the punch which is you know sentence number two it's not like mutually exclusive there could be a knock coming from the door and the closet's completely fine i don't know why we wouldn't assume that. Huh? I don't know. It it doesn't feel like I feel like we, we could rework it. Which is weird because But he thought he thought that the knock was coming at the door. Yes. Yeah, he said someone knocked at the door. Yeah. Therefore the there's too there's we know too little of this situation. <laughs> we don't know the layout of this home, Russell. Yeah, I I feel like the assumption put on the audience is that you're gonna assume it's the front door. Yes, that is the assumption. But I mean, However, mm. it could be, again, due to the construction of the home and the layout of the main street, we don't know if their front door is their main door. I know, I know. I'm just saying that, like, depending on where your um, theater of the mind takes you, like, for me, I imagine uh, somebody in their bedroom, like a child in their uh, room. I can think of three homes I've lived in where the main door was not the front door. What do you mean? What what was the main door then? Uh, garage door. Oh, okay. Like the most used door. Yeah. Like if someone came to our house and they knocked on the front door, they'd never been there. <laughs> Same. Oh, yeah. Weird. Yeah. When I was younger, I used to, um, you know, before the cell phone was invented, I would leave my garage door open because I lived in the garage. Yeah. And I would just tell everybody like, hey, just come over. Like, just pop in if you want to pop in. That's very much like the Boots Riley film. Randy, what's the name of the movie? Sorry to bother you. Thank you so much. What? Le really? Lakeith Stanfield lived in the uh, garage. And they up <laughs> said, accidentally opened up the garage door, and that was like the big reveal that their room was in the garage. Wow. You're making it feel like a thing. Well, it's a Bay Area thing. It takes place in Oakland, so. Oh, oh okay. So you're, you're right I in line. Know. So, But it, it, I feel like... Um... The premise there was that they're ashamed. Well, I mean... I was not ashamed. I was very happy to have my own area. I don't know if shame is a... Yeah, but embarrassed. Like, oh... Well, it's just like, well, again, I I think you're looking well, how old into were a situation... Uh, what are we talking, Randy? Late 20s, Mid early 30s. That's a little different. Although, Bay well, it's Bay Area, though. That's what I'm saying. I know, Bay Area. Yeah, rent's high. Sometimes you live in a garage, dude. Dude, sometimes a family lives in the garage. <laughs> we we were trying to rent a place across the street when I lived over um, uh, in Daly City. And it's like, oh, we can't afford this rent. How can anybody afford that? And it's like, oh, literally three families moved into a three bedroom. Like families. I'm talking like, you know, mom, dad, couple pets, Man, just a few rep, kids, a couple rep, cars. Wrap your shit, dude. Yeah. I, well, I don't know. I'm not anti-family. I'm anti high rent <laughs> i'm anti family i've seen what families do to people dude i'm a prime example of the cause that the love of a family can bring to a person nah it it made you interesting interesting yeah it made me go on the fast highway to a short death brother <laughs> <laughs> no early death maybe yeah <laughs> He's going to die little. Randy, you should know, I just took a hit of my vape before I said that, so. Damn. Oh, yeah. 
You're douching with the vape again? Oh, do we want to get into why I have to vape again? I, w- I was trying to soft or, you know, do we have, it to do you. Do we have some, like, some sort of legal, like, <laughs> sound cue? Well, did, dun, dun. did you, uh, is he caught up completely? Yeah. Okay. Oh, with our uh, landlord? Yeah. Randy, do you know about this situation? Yeah, I think it comes up during the interview, maybe, or maybe after record. Oh, oh yes. you did. You mentioned mention. in the interview. Well, we got a little summons by some Paul Blart rent a cop <laughs> <laughs> named. I don't want to name. I know his you name. You know the name. I know his name. Of course you do. So uh, let's just say that his name is the same as a very popular brand of vodka based out of Texas. Oh, I don't know. Texas vodka? Mm-hmm. No Randy, idea. Randy, do you know? No clue. Tito? Tito's, yes, of course. Oh, his name's Tito? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, all right, Tito. <laughs> What's the Ditos? <laughs> and he's like, um, actually, he reminded me, uh, Phil Hendry does a character named uh, Jay Santos from the uh, uh, Auxiliary Police Department. It's, it's very good. Citizens Auxiliary Police. Where he's a fake cop. And this guy reminded me of, of Jay Santos. But anyway. Did you even see the dude? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, you I, did? He knocked on the door. I was working. Oh, and I had I, no and idea. I knocked, he knocked on the door. I opened the door. And I saw something on the door that was, he had taped the, <laughs> the citation on the door. Yeah. And I was having a conversation <laughs> with him. So I'm, I'm looking at the citation and looking back at him. I was like, are these two connected? And I was like, oh, of course. And then he he proceeded to tell me that we had been reported as uh, someone reported a smoking at this address and that he named our address. I said, yes, that's correct. Um, he said, what well, did you know that there is a no s- smoking ordinance in the city of San Bruno? And I said, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, in, uh, in, in San Bruno, you cannot smoke. And I said, what are you talking about? Yeah. And I looked up the ordinance and yeah, uh, within uh, apartment complexes, uh, townhomes and condos you can't smoke unless it's uh th- of course it's all legal mumbo jumbo yeah. with everything but something about that and it, there has to be a sanctioned area or if something is pointed out by your landlord um and there needs to be 20 feet of clearance or something so fucking dumb yeah huh. So now I have to vape. See, I hate that shit because there are laws created that interfere with like human interaction. Like if we actually had a neighbor, first off, I don't even know. I can't fathom who the fuck reported this. Uh, if we had a neighbor that just walked over and knocked on the door instead and was like, hey, like, you know, I have like my kid lives up there and there's smoke going in the room and I'm uncomfortable. I'd be like, hey, chill for sure. But then you get a cop over here. Yeah. We don't know who did it. Yeah. So, I mean, now, of course, I would take it like a challenge. Well, here's the thing, is that we don't know who reported us, but we is well documented on this show that we have a rivalry <laughs> with our next door neighbors. Oh, yeah. My, uh, my money's on them. They're insane. I don't think so. I, I understand where you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. However, I mean, they've got bad credit at this bank. You know what I mean? <laughs> Okay, I so, mean, I mean, they I, are getting no benefits of the doubt. I've gotten into three confrontations with them, yeah. and I don't think it's them. I do know, however, that you work up here and you, uh, you uh, rain hate down on our motorcycle neighbor, cauliflower, cauliflower ear. ear you yeah. don't like dude across the way up on the balcony. Well, okay, See, that's <laughs> the other clue. He used to smoke up there, but I haven't seen him in a while. So I think oh. someone may report it him. You're going rear window now? Yeah. You're like, he's gone. Dude. I don't see him anymore. <laughs> was I, was now, anyone walking on the street when you were on the balcony? Everyone walks on that street I all know, the time. Did you see someone and they saw you and there was smoke in the air? Oh, hell no. That's even more. That's no. <laughs> Nobody down the little like hill reported you on a balcony. No way. Yeah, I don't think so. Also, uh, me and Oksana see people out there smoking all the time on that fucking street. Yeah, yeah I gotta... hear them at 2 a.m. Honestly, it's probably going around in our little court. That might be the people I see out there smoking now. It's like people living in this fucking court. I mean, they court. just took away the one thing I look forward <laughs> to every day is my 6 o'clock J. I hate it. They took it away. And you and every day you'd be like, yeah, I should probably stop. I know. <laughs> Well, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. Yeah, well, I honestly, I think that's what those kind of laws are made for. Cigarettes are, you know, 
They're intrusive. They're powerful. Well, they I mean, linger. Well, so does weed smoke. Weed smoke is yeah, but if, if, Rooney. if you're a um, a landlord and you're renting out a place to like some potheads, I wouldn't be worried that you're gonna walk in there and it's gonna smell like a fucking ganja farm or something. But like if if you know if they're smoking cigarettes all day, yeah, that's work. Like it's gonna cost you money. Yeah, got the kink over JFS. Oh, speaking of, are we are we good on this topic? Are we gonna segue? <sighs> Yes. Okay. I just want to give a a shout out to the three friends who finally got around to covering Tombstone, a movie I love, and uh, they talked about for a while. I honestly, I had never heard that there was a four hour director's cut hidden in Kurt Russell's um, vault, but I would love to see it. And when we went on the three friends podcast and I was trying to get them to review Tombstone with us there, yeah, I had teased that uh, my favorite YouTuber had done quotes from the movie. Correct. Uh, here's a couple. I just wanted to share them with you guys. And uh, remember, somebody cold asked him in the chat, hey, what's your favorite quote? And he went off on this. Wow. I didn't think you had it in you. I'm your Huckleberry. Why, Johnny Ringo? You look like someone just walked over your grave. <laughs> Fight's not with you, Holiday. I bet you did this up. Started the game, forgot to finish. Play for blood, remember? Well, I was just fooling about. <laughs> well, I wasn't. And this time, it's legal. Now, this video <laughs> that they made is just a cutout of him talking, but it's it's superimposed over the movie. So this pause he took, he really took. He knows not only the words, but the like moments the in beats. between. He knows it. Yeah. So here's a little bit more. No, oh, thanks. <laughs> Let's do it. Say when. <laughs> you go to hell <laughs> you first <laughs> why kate you're not wearing a bustle how oh, dude come on holiday you and her out yeah. god damn it <laughs> why and baby you look like you're about ready to burst cover your ears darling now when he did this on the live stream that's how it sounded where it's just like word mush do you watch it over there? He's doing multiple characters interacting with each other on the beat. It's fucking weird. He, I mean, we all knew he was highly regarded, but clearly he's like Did the we? right man of quotes. Like, yeah. this is his thing. And, uh, what th Russell, think about <laughs> it. I want you to think about a mutual friend that we have, or a mutual acquaintance, who is, uh, very similar in this regard. Really? Mm hmm. D were they a co-worker? Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's that's who I thought. Yeah, I knew that was all of that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's fucking weird. And, you know, I, I'm i a big film fan, and I like a lot of genre film. And one of the things you do when you're having a drink talking about a, your favorite, like, action movie, you quote it. Never been a quote guy. I know I've mentioned this before, but I fucking, I, I have to get them right, and I never do. And then I meet mother, I know, I have a couple of friends who, like, nail them. Yeah. I think they're all just regarded now. I think that's what it takes. You know who did that? No, you know who is an example of got the quotes wrong but didn't give a fuck? Was our old third chair. He used to do that shit all the time. <laughs> yes. And he would quote movies and I'd watch him and be like, oh, dude, you got that completely wrong. And I, I think those are the people we need to blame for the Mandela wrong, effect. Wrong quotes <laughs> are fun, though. No, I'm, you missed it. I do think that's real. The, like, Luke, I am your father shit. Like, yeah. the Mandela effect. I think... That's where it comes from. People not giving a fuck and for sure paying attention to the quest. Well, like Sally Field, Sally Field. Yeah. It, yeah, I know. You know? Does anybody give a fuck about Mandela Effect anymore? Nigel Bach? Yeah, Nigel Bach. Okay. Even that was like a year ago, okay. though. Can I tell you? We're all friends here. Yeah, you can you can tell me. I uh, I started uh, Bad Ben the the pandemic. Oh you bitch. I made it. Let's call Why? it three minutes. In. Why? Why'd you back out? You should watch the first three minutes. I can only imagine it being funny. It's almost two hours long. I know that, and that's why, <laughs> that's why I never jumped into it. Every time I looked uh, at the runtime, I got, I got freaked out. I'm like, oh, God. Dude, it's longer than King Kong versus Godzilla. It is longer <laughs> than King Kong versus Godzilla. That's a fact. It's, it's longer than fucking Monkey versus Lizard, dude. What the hell? <laughs> I here's I because I, I won't really cover King Kong versus Godzilla because it's King Kong versus Godzilla. Oh come on, 
uh, and y'all haven't seen it, or Godzilla versus King Kong. That's what it is. You better it's get just it right. Kong, dude. No King. Oh my god. <laughs> It's lizard versus monkey, dude. When it's fun, it's fun. When it's not fun, I I wanted it to end so badly. I don't know. When you and Mary Beth were talking about like Skull Island and shit, I was kind of getting into it. No, Skull Island I love. I love Skull Island. Skull Island's fantastic. And this this has mirrors of Skull Island. Did you have a dog in the fight? What do you mean? Like, were you rooting for one or the other? I was rooting for Kong. Okay. Don't tell me anymore. But I feel like you're on the verge of ruining the it. movie's painted towards Kong. I don't know. I love Adam Wingard. I think as uh, do I. The issues I have with the film are uh, creative. OK, I really don't like the script. Michael uh, Daughtry wrote it. Wait, go back. I, I, I don't like the, the story. Is that the Michael Daughtry from fucking. Um, oh, God, I almost called it Tales of Halloween. Trick or treat. It yes. is. What the fuck? And Krampus. Look at these horror guys sneaking in there. I'm sure I'm sure every fucking hack podcast knew that. I honestly have not been following it. I do like the artistic direction they took. Like I heard um somebody talking about how they made King Kong three times bigger. And they're like, oh. Yeah, whatever, who gives a fuck? Yeah, but th- dude, it's fun. Like That's dude, what I mean. I'm telling you, yeah. it's worth watching uh for the fight in the middle of the ocean. Okay. That was great. I'm telling Aircraft you. Aircraft carrier? Yeah, yeah, that looks rad. Dude, the the effects are incredible. Yeah. And this I think for my money, this is the best looking Godzilla. Dude, you know what you know what it's a metaphor for. Why do you have to bring everything? It's China and America, <laughs> oh bro. Oh my god. I we're we're going, going right for <laughs> shish. There's, there's yeah. a podcaster in the film too. Yes. Uh our boy Paperboy um is a podcaster. What the fuck? <laughs> Kong mm-hmm. has like Mjolnir, but it's like yeah, an th- ice axe. That's a that's a third act reveal. <laughs> oh Oksani ruining the movie. <laughs> God damn it. Also, uh, Japan would be very angry. Uh, Godzilla is a metaphor for our atrocious behavior in World War II and how we killed millions of civilians over there. That's what so Godzilla I about. wish I would have seen this in a theater. I think it would Oh, be, yeah. But. It's still playing. I, I want to go. When it's fun, it's fun, man. Yeah. And it, it looks really good. You know, I gave it three stars. <laughs> I want oh, it. Randy showed up. Within the first 15 minutes, I was like, okay this is fun and then 30 minutes later i was like this needs to be fun again (laughs) (laughs) that's the problem with versus movies man they you get hooked they you know they have to move the plot with the human characters and you're like it the whole movie's on their shoulders really yeah and yeah i mean i'm sure there's a reason why this movie wasn't two and a half hours long also kyle chandler's in this for like three minutes is that Very annoying. one of the guys from Friends? Uh, I don't like the Stranger Things girl. I find her to be annoying. Oh, I like her. I wish her. I don't like the show, but I like her, her endeavors. Okay. What well, we... I don't like how they used her in this. Let me let me rephrase that. Randy, are you gonna check li- it out? I don't like smart kids. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> smart kids are annoying. Like we don't need them. Like we've got smart kids in here, and then we've got a a a, a deaf girl who talks to King Kong. Who is Stop basically ruining the movie? The focal point of the movie was that like Amy, I, Amy and the gorilla oh, or whatever. Man. Also, you know, smart children in apocalypse movies are always about like a you know metaphor for the future. The children will save. Randy, are you going to watch this crap? I don't know. Maybe one day. I, don't, I mean, it, I, I watched the first eight minutes or so, and then I just wasn't in the mood for it. When would you be in the mood for it after a beer? I'm having one right now. I'm pulling that uh, another round, trying to get to point zero five. You know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why are all the pictures so bad? Because your resolution sucks. Man. Your computer can't handle the screenshots. <laughs> okay. All right, Randy Michael. Yes, sir. What you got, son? I got a new Tim Sutton film called Funny oh, no. Face. I don't know if any of you checked it out this week. I I almost watched it the other day, and I did not. And uh, our mutual friend and former guest, uh, Robbie Smith, uh, tweet, yep. uh, no, he Instagrammed story this, and I said, hey, man, my boy Tim Sutton do good on this? And he said, yeah, he loved it. He said the, uh, I believe he said that the camera work was juicy. Sure. I think that's, that's a word good. for it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, there's some really, really good looking shots in this movie. Um, agreed with that. So basically, uh, so I don't, I didn't see Donnie Brook, which came out between this and Dark Knight, but 
Robbie, not a fan of Donnie Brook. Interesting. I got to check that out. But I think we all loved Dark Knight. If you've listened to this podcast for the last four years, you heard us talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is, you know, the the vibe and the mood of the movie is very similar. Uh, but it takes place uh, around Brooklyn, I think around Coney Island. And the, oh. the plot from IMDb uh, says that the destruction of his grandparents' house leads a young man to take revenge under a masked persona. And then uh, eventually along the way, like pretty early on in the film, he meets a girl at a bodega who is uh, attempting to shoplift. Uh, her name is Zama. And then they essentially uh, get to talking, kind of know each other. Um, the main guy, Saul, um, is very like quiet and introverted and kind of weird. Uh, it kind of looks like a, like a denim jacket, like punk. Um, I don't know. He had, a, he had a great screen presence. There's a scene where he eats a donut that is very satisfying. Victor Garber's in this? I thought he's been dead. Oksana, click on Victor I guess Garber. so. Is he still with us? Developer's father, Victor Garber. Tight. Um, yes, I don't know what else to say. If you're into oh, no. stuff that Tim Sutton does, if you like Dark Knight, you're going to dig this. Uh, if you don't like movies that don't really uh, have a ton of plot but are very moody, um, you probably won't like it. But yeah, if you uh, like us, like the dark, liked Dark Knight, not The Dark Knight, uh, I think you're going to love it. Dark Knight over The Dark Knight all day. Was, was there a lot of dialogue in Funny Face? Um, no, not a ton. There is a lot of shots where, you know, the camera just lingers, uh, even when like people aren't in the frame and, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, quiet within the film, but, uh, as well with, uh, Dark Knight, there is a little bit of like tension and you kind of feel like something bad is going to happen soon. Like I really liked the main character saw early on in the movie. And I texted Robbie like while watching it because I saw that he already like reviewed it on Letterbox. I was like, "Am I gonna be bummed out that I like this kid so much?" <laughs> so I thought he was gonna just you know do something terrible. Um, yeah. So not to spoil anything, but yeah, right, good, it's solid. Don't. Man, are you a mid movie texter? I have a couple of friends like that who, you know, they'll watch a movie you recommended a month later, and then they'll text you beat by beat through the film. Yeah. Do you do that? Not really, no. Um, like every once in a while, I'll shoot someone like, yeah, a text in the middle if, you know, I know yeah. that they had watched it, but I'm not like, yeah, not, not a, I'm not live tweeting the thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, you know, the live tweet is a thing I hadn't done until the film fest. And I actually had a lot of fun doing it. Like yeah. I get it, but I don't know for not an event. Like if I just threw on tombstone and started blowing up the three friends, like, Oh, dude, sure. Dark Holiday. I would feel like such a menace. I don't know. I think we should do a um, Three Friends and Doughboys mashup in the next <laughs> week, Randy, we review Tombstone Frozen Pizza. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm down. Not also, sure. Funny Wait. Face is a cheap rental. I believe it's also cheap to buy, so I'm kind of bummed. I think it's literally like two bucks more to buy it, so I should have just bought it, but well, maybe it'll uh, come out on Blu-ray. Yeah, didn't um, Oscilloscope put out Tim Sutton's other work? I can't remember who uh, did. You know who has funny face? Who? Listen, all of y'all, it's on Gravitas! Oh, yeah. Where you Gravitas going? is cool. They put out good stuff. Randy, don't you ever say yeah. that in front of me ever again. Clark has a bit about not liking Gravitas. I got beef with him. Based man. on nothing. Interesting. You know, I have a beef with Tim Sutton. I think he's a guest whom I've received a, a direct email to three times from, like, program directors. And I've emailed him mo more than any other director to be on this show. Nothing. I never got a response. <laughs> and the thing is, I don't act. I'm not actually mad because I honestly think he's just never looked at his email. I think he's one of those guys that's like impossible to get a hold of. Like, Does he do a lot of interviews? I don't think so. And I also think um, the type of work he makes is probably very demanding. You know, Tim Sutton, Jim Cummings. Oh, I never emailed Jim. I think I've signed a, emailed him 14 times. No, I just told you that. <laughs> he went on, he went on, uh, he did Doug Loves Movies, dude. Oh, we're Tim bigger Sutton? than that. Yeah. No, uh, Jim Tim, Tim Sutton. Oh. That'd be a hell of an episode. I was like, that'd be fucking weird, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. No, wait, okay, you know how we just got excited about that odd pairing? 
who would be a weird guest to have on this show that would just be so wrong that it would be Oliver Stone? No, I would. I would talk to him. I would not talk to Oliver Stone. I'm. I'm not a fan. That's not true. I'm not a fan. But I would talk to him because his son boring. is a weirdo. You know, he was teaming up with Alex Jones for a while, and then he went and made a found footage movie. So we would have a lot to talk about. And I mean, Oliver Stone's in it. I mean, look, you need to give us more credit. What credits do? Like we 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 made it with Sandy Tan. Is I think it's Greystone Park. She's very important. Yes, she unfriended me on Instagram. She's got a book, book out now. Shout out. <laughs> yeah well she's not coming on this show to promote it yeah look up Greystone Park yes, I'm just kidding Sandy we wish you nothing but success And I, although you are missing out I'm a good Instagram player. I think I nailed that <laughs> Sean Stone is that his um kid yeah yeah Greystone Park you know what we should show that enough one year it's such an oddity it opens up with um Sean Stone and like his family in like a long table and Oliver Stone's at the head and they're having like some intellectual conversation and then he's like all right let's go and then they go and investigate a haunted <laughs> abandoned uh hospital all right it's a fucking weird movie third act uh not worth warning it. trespassers will be executed that's a little harsh yeah look at the cover it's fucking yeah i know not good graystone park randy. sorry randy i know i'd like hijacked no, it's all good. movie two is a movie called shiva baby <laughs> Directed by uh, Emma Seligman. No. Um, yeah, so the movie starts out with a uh, sexual encounter with a 20-something <laughs> like college girl. Kind of older guy. His name's Max. <laughs> there's, a, uh, a, a financial, there's a financial <laughs> transaction, and then the scene ends. Um, and then the rest of the movie from there Wait, takes place. <laughs> um, between Ooh, themselves, the or did they go to like a bodega? No, between them. Like a smoked. <laughs> It's a, uh, it's like a sugar daddy situation, you would say. Oh, well, that's a rad cover where her dress kind of looks like a uh, dining room table, or is that? And it looks like a bunch of cream cheese it looks like with cream on it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the power of a picture. You know, you you think it's one thing, and then you look closer, and it, Shiva, it baby. evolves. <laughs> also, what was that harsh hit, bro? <laughs> you started <laughs> choking know. after that vape. My God. Okay. I'm sorry. Randy. Vape life, baby. <laughs> Thanks, San Bruno. So from there, the rest of the movie takes place uh, in one location. It is a house uh, during a <laughs> post-funeral uh, service, sort of like, you know, get together, uh, where Rachel, who is the main character from the opening scene, gets dragged to by her parents. At the party, uh, she runs into her ex-girlfriend from high school and also the dude from the first scene. And, uh... With whom she had the coitus. Indeed, yes. Mm. And then, uh, yeah, from there it becomes a quite funny and also stressful and kind of anxiety-inducing experience. Uh, kind of think like a much less serious and more funny Kresha, or like Aronofsky's oh. mother. Kresha, Kresha, Kresha. Randy, my boy uh, Fred Melamad's in this. Yeah, I was just going to mention him. He is great, as well as... Um, Rachel, who plays uh, the main character. Um, yeah, there's a ton of like extras, and everyone in this movie is very good and funny, and I really dig the writing. The score um, is very like percussive and kind of like staccato, um, and very like atonal and sort of like off-putting, which very much puts you in her, uh, you know, stressful state uh, of mind. And yeah, it's uh it's really good. I think it's a seven dollar rental. I think it just came out this past weekend. All right. Interesting. She I watched I watched a movie last night with Fred Melamed. Randy, you wanna guess what I watched? It's a rewatch. I'll give you that clue. No Randy idea. Fred? Or a rewatch. A rewatch. Okay. I'll gi I'll I'll give you a hint. And he's in all three of these, but you need to guess which one. It was an S. Craig Zoller film. Brawl in Cell Block 99. That's correct. <laughs> I rewatched that for the 19th time last night. How'd it play? Nice. It's great. Although, I will tell you, I only watched the second half. Oh, that's <laughs> weird. I was in a crunch for time. It's long, I, right? Well, 212. Dude, yeah. Look, all you need is you get to the part where Udo Kier goes to the prison, and then that's where it all right. picks up. 212? Is it shorter than Pandemic? Yeah, it's longer. It's longer than pandemic. All right, pandemic's like one forty nine. That's my new measure. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> is it longer or shorter than a uh, bad band pandemic? 
Randy, this looks good. I um, I'll check this out. You're talking about Shiva Baby? It's real good. Yeah, sure. I uh, also recommended it to uh, Mickey on the uh, the Discord, and he was quite a fan as well. Oh, we didn't bleep you out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't say crass things. Oh, but do you listen to that crap band? I do say no. I don't actually. They're they're a little too crust punky for me. Oh, crust punk. Like yeah, it's a thing. Crust. Just like dirty punk, you know. Stuffed crust punk. <laughs> well, it's all like dirty punk. Hey, have you ever heard that, Randy? That's mine. I'm coining that. <laughs> I haven't. That's good. <laughs> it's like fat crust punk kids. <laughs> They're stuffed crust. Okay. I've got one of two things that we can talk about. All right. One of which I think Randy watched his television show. And the other is the story of how you lost your virginity. That is a story that is just <laughs> was steeped there, in sadness. Was there a monetary transaction? And no, or one, and I was like, <laughs> it was a monetary <laughs> interaction. All right. It was just is ringing a flesh covered cowbell. That's all that was. <laughs> that's God. That's grotesque. <laughs> like, good job. Some Ed Gein shit. That's very like um, body horror. <laughs> Cronenberg's working on my yeah, last story. Cronenberg would direct uh, Both the story of, of Clark and Little. They're going to team up. Father think, and son. I think Cronenberg would do a good job. With flesh-covered cow- cowbell? <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go okay, with number two. So I watched uh, <laughs> the QAnon HBO thing. Boo. Or yeah. I also watched, for the first time, because I'm not a good fan of horror, man. If you like werewolves... Then you need to see Ginger Snaps. So I watched motherfucking Ginger Snaps. Yeah. Which... I don't want to comment unless you talk about it. Okay. Randy, let's talk about QAnon. <laughs> no. no, Ginger Snaps, which the way the affectation should be is Ginger Snaps. I think they're, they're being playful there. They are being. Of course they're being yeah. playful. There's no cookies in this movie. <laughs> like, there's no, other re- there's no reason to call this movie Ginger Snaps. Unless there's a girl named Ginger. Dude, look at that poster. Such a good movie. It's all right. Did you enjoy it? I did enjoy it. I did enjoy it. Because, Randy, have you seen Ginger Snaps? I have not, no. I think, I think this, I think, Randy, there's something there. Randy would like it. Especially when it came out. Like, at the, when it originally came out, the, it was very unlike everything. Like, now it's kind of like, I don't know. They do kind of like good feminist narratives and like interesting things with like well, the yeah. first the first act of this movie is like um ghost world kinda. Yeah. You know, you've got these uh two outcast girls, now in this case they're sisters, and um they stick together because they know that they're sort of uh the outliers in their, you know, high school community. And then the the whole film really takes a different narrative with the whole werewolf thing. Is it sort of, um, you know, talking about, uh, you know, going into womanhood, I guess. Do we need Oksana to talk about that? (laughs) Oksana, what happens? It's that time of the month, you know, when the moon is full. Yeah. Well, but, well, but obviously, you yeah. know, they, they are pretty heavy handed with all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, but my girl Mimi Rogers is in this. I didn't know she was that. Mm-hmm. She's the mom. Uh, Mimi Rogers, formerly married to Tom Cruise. Oh. Did you know that? No. Mimi Rogers is like the ultimate MILF. Dude. I couldn't pull Mimi Rogers out of a lineup. I would pull so. old Mimi <laughs> Rogers' big old milk bags. Baby. All right, let's get Mickey to bleep that. <laughs> Randy, don't copy Mickey in that regard, please. All right, so what'd you think? You know, you know, very why, honest. Yeah, it's probably ten minutes too long. Yeah, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it since. Um, I feel like that third act drags out, man. Well, the third act is. Uh, I don't know. I disagree. What didn't you like about it? It just like wh- now when it concluded. Yeah, I was like, okay, this is I I sign off on this because it's. I think the problem with a horror movie that um, achieves much more than just being a horror movie, yeah, like Ginger Snaps. I think when the climax comes and it turns into a horror climax, it's actually kind of um, unfulfilling. 
You know, like there's such a good emotional arc there and the characters are very interesting. And then we kind of linger in like a chase and like gore. And it's kind of like, that's cool. But yeah. man, everything else was so much like more interesting. But it ends. I mean, but the end end is very emotional. Oh, yeah. No, it's it's a great movie. And um, the Yerba Buena, back when our boy uh, Robson was there, dude, they showed it on Halloween in 35 millimeter. That's one of those things where when I go around and, you know, we talk to so many horror fans, I mention that and people are like, get the fuck out of here. Like nobody shows that movie in 35. I think there's like one print in Canada that they had come out here for that. Well, this is a Canadian production. Yeah, right? yeah. That, that's what I mean. And at the Yerba Buena at the time, very under attended. Really? Yeah. That's one of the reasons why we started doing the Overlook theater thing was it's like, how is this room not full? Like there are so many people that would kill to be here. And I'll tell you, dude, in 35, it looked beautiful, too. I bet. But, you know, when we were talking with um, Jillian about uh, I Blame Society, every time they had mentioned, like, oh, yeah, your short films, like the weird, bloody things, I always thought of this movie. In the beginning, how they do that very kind of, like, 90s, like, oh, look how grotesque and, like, yeah, morbid we are. Yeah. Yeah, which now is kind of, like, I don't know, quirky or cute. But at the time, it was kind of, like, ooh, edgy. Yeah, I don't know. I I fucking love that movie. Yeah, no. Uh, it, now you got to watch part two. Why? Um, because it's an interesting thing they do with the story. So, uh, Ginger Snaps has a trilogy, and it's very loose. Part two, um, uh, without ruining anything, one of them ends up in a uh, ward, and is kind of like haunted by the things that happened in part one, and it's it's good. And uh, honestly, I go back and forth. Like, sometimes I like part two more because it's more genre. Don't click through that because you're going to there's stuff that you would ruin. Part three is almost a complete reboot in like a fantasy setting in a snowed village. It is fucking weird. Hmm. It's very different. And part three is one of those things where all horror fans are just like, well, how did we get here and why did they do this? Any any of the same cast or? It's yeah, all yeah the, no, they're both in them. All of them. All of them? Yeah, all of them. Catherine Isabel and Emily Perkins, yeah. Okay. Also, Catherine I- Isabel, she's um American Mary. Stay away, American Mary. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> also, in the next one, I hear she ends up in a Montgomery ward. That was pretty good. Are you looking for- Oh, God. <laughs> Hey, okay, so the fest is over. We need to, like... Is it? We need to... I know. <laughs> dude, when we did our interview this weekend, I was like, dude, how long ago was that film fest? Yeah. And it was like, last weekend. Because well, time is pointless, man. Yeah, it's man. fucked. It's really weird. I don't know. I'm thinking about moving to Finland. It feels... <laughs> oh, that, yeah, that will help. <laughs> I don't know. Finland seems cool. You get really into Lordy when him. Him? He's from Finland? I'm pretty sure they're from Finland. Oh, hard pass. That's where they ripped off uh, <laughs> 69 eyes. I don't know. What's going on in uh, Austria? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it's where... It's uh, pretty over there. Tom Six is from. No, is he's, no he's Danish. Oh, okay. Oh, Denmark. Blame the Dane. Yeah, I go to Denmark. I don't know. They, they got weird outlets everywhere. <laughs> what else <are> you, <laughs> <what> else <laughs> did you watch? <sighs> QAnon. Okay. And I mean... Yeah, you talked to me a little bit about it. It seems like you're not jazzed on it. Randy, what did you think of the, the, the series as a whole? Q into the storm. I don't know. It was uh, informational. You know, I didn't really, like, know <laughs> too much about, like, what was going on. Or, like, I knew of 4chan and 8chan, but I didn't, like, know much about it. And I don't know. It was interesting. I, like, I was into not- it. You know, the- I'm not a fan of the storytelling that Cullen Hoback uh, approached this yeah. Yeah. way. Um, now, I do understand that, I mean, he, look, I greatly appreciate his dedication to this because this was three years yeah. that he spent going back and forth. Uh, he, he, well, went he was all over early, the place. too. He was early on. He it. was early because yeah. like, he spent so much time in the Philippines and in Japan and China. He went to Italy on yeah. a lark. So, like, he went all over the place. Um, so the access is incredible. However, I feel like you could have done a little bit better job investigating this thing. Like, you could have knocked this up 
pretty quickly. The thing I didn't like, and again, I only watched one episode, was that um, I didn't like the characterization of the forums, like of 8chan and 4chan. Because, you know, the, the reason those forums exist and are populated is because they're they're kind of like, you know, the dark corner of the internet where you can kind of say whatever the fuck you want. And I think a lot of people go there just to like, kind of like vent. Also, a lot of weird outcast people go there and they they turn into communities. And I feel like whenever a dude looking for a story goes there, they kind of find the like deepest pits and just dig out from the bottom. And they're like, so that's, Look really, out. that's a, throughout the whole series. They do not portray 8chan as a site you should go to. Yeah, of course. Now, I mean, because it's just it's a boring way to approach it because they're what I liked about feel good. It feel what the hell is it? Feels good, man. Feels good, man. Is that um that movie? They had people from the forum who were just like moderators. Like these are dudes who just were in it because that was their community, and they weren't like necessarily proud of it. Because I mean, who would be proud? Like airing weird message board shit in front of a camera. Yeah, but they were kind of like. Hey man, I, like you could get the sense that like, oh, you're kind of just a dork who felt burned by people. And I mean, we can all like, you know, we've all been there and you could kind of sympathize with them where that dude in that first Q episode, I was kind of like, man, they're already painting the like, it's our dumb inbred South and they're like fucking cultists. And now that God's gone, they're looking for a new, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm like, come on, we're better than this shit. Like it's a, I don't know. The strength of this is the access, uh, because he was actually there in the storming of the Capitol. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I, Ray, I did quite enjoy his editing and his song choice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that so that was actually pretty good. Um, now is that footage like worth watching, or is it like is it grandized to be like extra violent or like? No, I mean he does he does cut it with like footage that we've seen. Yeah, like news footage and stuff like that. Um, but the fact that, you know, he was there with, you know, Jim Watkins, who yeah. is reportedly now the father of QAnon, is Ron Watkins, his son, who was the um, engineer of, uh, he was the, I don't know, moderator? What what, what did he say? He was, yeah. he was running it. He was running yeah. 8chan after Hot and, Wheels yeah. uh, gave up 8chan. And the nature of that website is that you cannot figure out who is Fred posting, your, Fred even if you are the head of it. So they really can't pinpoint him. Yeah. Although I mean in the in you know in the final episode uh he did kind of trip up. Yeah, but so unless he came out and was like yeah it was me. I mean, I will check this out too. The the dude if he did do it. You know, Q that whole shit. Like there was a point where I would have bought a shirt cuz I thought it was fucking funny. Yeah. Like all the weird like lingo and like codex and all that shit like I dude, I would totally would have worn one. Now that it's so politicized and people get like on their high horse, I wouldn't touch it. No. But a lot of shirts were sold. We watched um what all gas no breaks like early. He was at like UFO convention. They had a Q corner, and it's like there was a lot of money going around. That dude wasn't getting it. Like he's not the type of dude that made some false god that people worshipped and then and then marketed him. Well, yeah, because I mean, they spend so much time talking about how HN makes zero money. Yeah, yeah, because it's impossible. Like, who's gonna sponsor? I'm, I'm just. I think that's a really important insight. Is that this dude was kind of just doing it, and he did. He honestly, he didn't even seem very passionate. Well, about the it. thing is, is that I mean, now, Randy, I may be interpreting this incorrectly, but from what I understand. I think that Q was probably someone else, and he just took over. And took it over, yeah. Kind of seems that way, yeah. And again, I've I've been kind of following this for a while. And there there was a like wave of podcasts that came out that were like, "We're gonna figure out who Q is," and it's like you're kind of missing the point. But well, Russell, I do recommend you watching this just because of the um, the access and the character studies that we see. You yeah, know, Jim Watkins is as disgusting as he is as a human. I mean, he, 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 you have to watch him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. And the fact that he moved to Clarksdale, Mississippi, just, <laughs> oh, upsets you me. You know, I'm not, much. I'm not quick to like hate people. And I feel like that dude didn't, like, okay, I do agree. I do think it is him from everything I've heard. And I, but I also think he had no real grasp of like the power of that movement and like how um, faithful they were. So I don't know. Yeah. I'm sure I'm sure he wants to crawl under a rock and like 
I part of me even liked Ron Watkins, like watching this series too. <laughs> yeah, Ron is um, who we're talking about is the um, and then his father Jim, which yeah, Jim's Ron, a little sketchier, but yeah, oh, I don't Jim, know something about is... Ron. Just like it's probably just because he talks very uh, monotonous and kind of slow, and he's very just chilled like me. I just. Yes, I don't know. Right. It just seems I, similar. There, there are connections between you and, <laughs> and, and Ron Watkins, except uh, Ron Watkins is a trained uh, in mixed martial arts, right? Now. Yeah, but Rin yeah. is not far off. Dude, the like skinny coffee drinking, living in the East Bay vibe. Dude, Randy's like two weeks away from drinking Randy, Muay Thai. <laughs> take some Taekwondo, dude. No, do Muay Thai. That'd be tight. I'd be down for some. I took karate <laughs> when I was a kid. Oh, shit. Hell yeah. <laughs> I remember you made a movie about it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> when can we when can we put that out there, Randy? Never. On Blue. Come Rise. on. You know, let's do another uh live stream like we did with the fest, but we'll live stream that movie and we'll put it behind a protected wall so nobody can take Randy, it. Randy, who's got the rights? <laughs> My friend Kyle who directed it. All right. Well let's get Kyle. We'll hang out. And this will be the first merch that we sell. <laughs> <laughs> We'll hang out. We'll live stream it. It'd be fun. Oh, dude, we could live stream it. Vernon, uh, I'll tell Vernon. Oh, my God. You're fucking <laughs> deep, Pam. He'll intro it. Dude. It's packing a punch tonight. Packing a punch. Yeah, right. I don't know. Q. I think that was all. Dude, I don't watch movies anymore, man. I, I feel you. We're, we're out of the film fest now, so we'll be good. Although we did. Uh, when do you want to talk about the movie we all I don't watched? know. You want to do it last? I could go next into a... Uh, I have kind of a lot to say about one, and then, yeah, not a lot for All right, other. we'll close with the one we all saw. All right, then um, on Good Friday, the day after April Fool's, we uh, went out. By we, I mean Oksana and I. Um, who else went? Terrell? Charles. I don't know. Yeah, we had Chuggy out there. He, w- there was not a shooting this time at the mall, although he was prepared to <laughs> bend over backwards like it was the Matrix. You've got to stop <laughs> saying that. <laughs> Are you gonna bleep me? You gonna fucking censor I will me, dude? Mickey, you dude. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, slip your Mickey. We went out there because <laughs> on my way home from work, somebody said, "Dude, want to go see this? It opens tonight." It was called The Unholy, and I was like, "Wait, there's a possession movie opening on Good Friday, dude? Fuck yeah!" Now the thing is, when a horror movie aligns with the holiday, and they actually put it out near that holiday, that typically means it's going to be a fucking terrible movie and they're really trying to hedge their bets and make as much as they can yeah man they're trying to this that that is the modern day william castle <laughs> that is the close that's how lazy it's we like are. look at your calendar yeah dude like, we did it it's the same day in the movie <laughs> so yeah happy death day um when in blind the movie was called the unholy uh the cover of the movie is a statue of the Virgin Mary um holding a rosary with, beads. With weird hands. She's got uh uh what's his name? Um Salad Fingers. Oh, that's Ooh. that was pretty good. I was thinking Doug Jones. Salad fingers. Dude, if salad <laughs> fingers cubicle. Or like the Baba Duke hands. No, if salad fingers were live action, you know it'd be Doug Jones. Did you know Salad Fingers, <laughs> the guy who animates Salad Fingers, did a commercial talking about Salad Fingers and how he's on Patreon now? Oh, and he's on 8chan. In fact, I think he's Q. <laughs> Dude, if Q is Salad Fingers, I am on board. Now, Salad I, Fingers was like the craziest thing when I was in college. Well, can you pull um uh the Unholy up again? I need Clark to try and pronounce the writer-director's name. Oh, he tried to when I mentioned No, he na- he nailed it, though. We talked about it last week. I know. Can you do it again? Written and directed by... Evan? Yep. Spilatupolis. I think that's right. Actually, could you? Th- uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. I think you nailed it. Spilatupolis, who uh, you may have known. Spilatupolis. This is the first time uh, he's gotten behind the directing uh, vehicle. I don't know why. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> up, baby. Then, after the reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, he may want to jump in front of that vehicle now. But is that CG fire? Oh, CG fire is uh, one of the notes I wrote down. Mm. There's a lot of it. So many. There's a lot. I mean, like they're they're going for a Guinness Book World Records in this movie. Anyway, this this motherfucker wrote like every B Disney movie ever. 
He did The Jungle Book 2. He did The Lion King 3, Hakuna Matata. He did Mickey Donald Goofy, The Three Musketeers. No. He wrote Pooh's Heffalump movie, Tarzan 2, The Legend Begins, uh, Cinderella 3, A Twist in Time. Dude, the, the Little Mermaid, Ariel's Beginning. And then he wrote The Nutty Professor. He's he's weird, man. Later on in his career, he wrote the Hercules movie that I have a prop from with The Rock where they try to subvert fantasy. Oh, he's going to write Bright, too. Dude. He's going to write Bright, too. I know. I don't know how I feel about it. He also wrote Charlie's Angels. He did the live action Beauty and the Beast. He did uh, The Huntsman. Hey, hey, let me tell you something. The live action Beauty and the Beast was pretty good. Um, should Oksana watch it? That's her favorite movie. You never watched it? I think we own it. Somebody bought it for us because they know she loves Beauty and the Beast, but... Beauty and the Beast is my favorite Disney princess movie, I guess. Why didn't you take her to go see Beauty and the Beast? I, sh she's got good taste, and I think she was worried about it. It's a good movie. <laughs> yeah, I think you also might be the only other person other than my mom who has said that. I don't I don't know anybody else that enjoyed that movie. Oh, uh, well, you should ask the broad who I went out on a date with because she liked oh. it too. <laughs> how, long, how long ago? This was four years ago. All right. Also, I should uh, give you a shout out for my dad who uh, was having a fight with his employer and refused to talk to him until he watched your segments from the Uff live stream and then texted me that uh, you're hilarious and he loves you. And then he proceeded to mend the relationship with his boss. Look, that's all I try to do with my comedy is bring people together. Is that's this, all you can hope for. Is her name Goo Goo? <laughs> what are you looking at? What is happening? Look at it. <laughs> okay. I'm going to turn your mic off. Okay. Yeah, so, okay. <laughs> so the unholy. I knew nothing about it. We went in there. Again, this is COVID area or COVID era. But again, theaters are open. So they do that really obnoxious thing where they break up every row. And if you buy a ticket, they block off the seats next to you. Correct. So if you go with friends and you don't all buy the tickets, you can really like. It's a mess. It can get fucking weird. Um, we yeah. worked it out. We got in there. And uh, I'm going to just. All the reviews of this movie. Like if you look um, online, it's all oh predictable PG-13 boring horror. And I'm like. I disagree. This movie has such a weird story to it and i i don't think it's on purpose but so it's based on a book um of a similar idea where a journalist goes out and kind of discovers the birth of a new religion and it's under the guise of christianity in this film however we're greeted to a uh, jeffrey dean morgan do you know who that is oh please do not insult me all right i, I know the man he's a he's a, a hunky boy dude i uh didn't know who he was and terrell was like you don't know negan from the walking dead <laughs> yeah yeah i'm like i stopped watching before that so uh our lead character is uh jeffrey dean morgan who looks like a he was the comedian in watchman i know i knew that only when i pulled him up on imdb i had no idea yeah he in this movie looks like a new york hipster but like kind of like that slightly jock kind where it's like a bigger dude. He's got like lame tattoos on it from his knuckles to his neck. Um, he also is quickly we learned that he's a disgraced journalist. Oh, wrap like, your wrap like your me. Oh, wrap your head around that because we I mean, journalism's dead pretty much. And I can't like remember all my friends. When's the last time a journalist got like ousted? Uh, Whitney Webb, dude. I mean, they've been canceled, but not like so. Cancels we, the new Owls, dude. Yeah, it's it's different though. As as far as yeah, anyway, so we're we're introduced to him, and uh, he's being contacted from what appears to be like a web dork, like oh, I run a blog that's pretty popular, and he's going to pay him to drive out and investigate a cow mutilation. Now, um, Negan is not happy. Is, is that a heavy metal band? Cow <laughs> cow mutilator. Yeah. Cattle mutilator. Cattle. I don't, yeah. yeah. Don't don't call me out. I'm tired. No, that was a, uh, yeah, my friend Hunter. There's Warner. cattle decapitation. Cattle decapitation. I'm That's it. Yeah. Um, you what? What? <laughs> Why did you listen to them? No, was that I, college Clark? No, because I have avoided going to see them in concert for years. It's Pit my Clark? friend Hunter. Nah, there. It's death grindcore stuff. It's whatever. You wouldn't dig it. I know. You need you need something with a little bit more um, soul, funk, heart, uh, love, whimsy, whimsy. <laughs> 
anyway, so I do need wins. Negan's bummed out. He's like, dude, pay me two hundred dollars and I'll drive out there. And the guy's like, one fifty, no negotiation. He's like, my old job. You know how much I was making. He's like, well, get your old job back. And he hangs up. Nice. That's kind of what we deal with. So we get um sick dialogue. We get fucking urban hipster driving out into the bumpkin woods. Right. He goes there and um he meets this guy who's got like a farm that ha- seems to have only one cow that's standing up. And he's like, where's the mutilation? He's like, come back here. And somebody had drawn an M on the cow's um, hind quarter. And he's, he gets very angry. He's like, dude, I drove all the way fucking out here. They're not going to pay me for a picture of this. And he's like, I don't know. Isn't it the Satanist around here? And uh, much like all the reviews, I was a little worried that I was going to come into a boring PG-13 movie at mm-hmm. this point. Well, um, the disgraced journalist then decides... I got to figure something out. So he starts looking around much at, now Charles out loud, because this motherfucker can't shut up during the movie. He goes, oh, what is this? A video game. And uh, he's kind of <laughs> correct because there's one tree in this field. And of course it's got a hollowed out trunk. And in the trunk, there's a shiny. What I mean by a shiny is that they put like a gif of something like sparkling all of like resident evil. Like, Hey, pick up this oh, crane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, Kind yeah. of shining, and he's like, "What the fuck?" And oh. nailed it. it. So he walks over there, you know, because he sees the glimmer. Spillatupolis knows I what's know. up. Right? <laughs> and he and he, he picks, knows his audience. He picks up a little like creepy Clark doll, and it, it's I think they call it a Kern doll. And he's like, "What the Kern hell is this?" Doll? Yeah, and so he looks at it, and there's rope all around it, and there's a Uh-oh. date. It's like eighteen eighteen eighty five or something. And he's just like, "What the hell?" Twenty years after the Civil So War. then the dude comes over. And he's like, what's the, oh, that's a Kern doll. They bury those for good luck for harvest. And he went, no. Well, I don't know. He says something along the lines of, well, it's good luck now. And he throws it on the ground and stomps its head in and then takes a picture of it. And he's like, here's the story. So now I'm like, what are we doing here? This movie is about Negan fabricating a story. He sends it in. And uh, oh, also, I I failed to mention, much like the urban hipster uh, loser that he's portraying, he's also like a a brutal alcoholic. So he hangs out here. He fabricates the story. He gets the country bumpkin to take a picture with the doll. And he's like, "Okay, cool. I'm going to get my money on the way out of town. He's fucking blitzed. So he's trying to drive out. And uh, it's that classic horror thing where there's a girl in the road. And then it's like, and you swerve off and drive through trees and shit. Well. He comes back after uh, wrecking his car, and there's a real girl walking somewhere. Of course, I don't know how the geography worked out, but she ends up right at the tree. She walks into like a dense forest and ends up at that single tree in the in the, the field. And he follows her there, and she starts talking and like, like there's somebody there, but there's nobody there. I'm sure you can imagine exactly how this looks. The weird thing is, when they find him, he's like, oh, hey that girl blah 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 and they're like oh she can't talk she's deaf and she's mute and deaf oh. and it's like he's like she's no single? i heard her i heard her and uh dude so he's drunk they won't let him drive they take him to a hotel the next day he comes to service and uh it's a miracle she she's cured and now she's claiming that the virgin mary spoke to her in that tree of course now this movie takes a weird turn because oh now it does the dilemma here who cares about the ghost you can already imagine the twist in this movie is that carrie elwis shows up Ooh. and he plays like a uh his character what, from the what would you call Bride. him he's <sighs> he's a bishop okay he's part of like the avengers that debunk um uh un- or you know fake miracles what, what the hell would you call that like when people are reporting that there's like, oh, I saw the Virgin Mary in this chip and now um, I can walk again. Yeah. Oh, dude, there's a scene with a kid in a wheelchair. You would have died. <laughs> His parents are overacting without any lines. And if you're watching them, like their faces, the whole movie, it's so good. Right. Anyway, so the guy releases the story. Um, it starts blowing up. The girl starts curing people with miracles. Uh, now, the UFO guy. Um, he won't sell him the story and he tries to negotiate back with his like New York job because he's trying to get back into the newspaper that kicked him out. Now we learn that he also was fired because he lied. He fabricated a story. So at this point, I'm like, it's weird because journalism's so bad right now. And we have so much like uh, 
like just like bad reporting, like straight up lying in media that there's like a whole information crisis going on with regular people. And this, this is news to me. So this, this movie, <laughs> this movie almost took a like very um, timely stance right now. Except that the punishment on this journalist was like, I haven't seen that shit. Unless you're Glenn Greenwald abandoning your own publication, you are not feeling any pressure by anybody. So I'm like, okay, where are we going here? Well, uh, I'll go ahead and I'll ruin this. I'll tell you, there's a lot of CG ghost no, shit. No, I wanted to see this movie. You're not going to watch it. I was going to go see it. Are you really? I won't, yeah. I won't say anything. I was going to go. Okay, there's a lot of CG fire. There's a ring moment that's not anything like the ring, but you'll know exactly what i'm talking about when you watch it mm, boy. you'll love that uh the the entity looks pretty cool yeah. the acting is all good the story and what the fuck they do with it is fucking dumb and i'll tell you the moral of the story which won't ruin anything yeah is that journalists need to repent um if they come out and tell the truth then they'll finally realize they should move away from uh the big city and just settle with the cute girl on a farm and uh, we can all go back to living a moral life. It's weird because I give a lot of shit to woke movies. And I almost felt like this was a sneaky other direction. Like where it's kind of like anti-urban, um, pro big living. Also, they, they th there's a weird ghost of like racism back here. So you constantly think they're going to make some narrative about like, um, I don't know, Jim Crow or something. And they don't. Yeah. But there's things like they drop a Martin Luther, uh, Martin... Martin Luther, no, I can't say it. King. There we go. Martin Luther you King. You couldn't think Jr. of Martin Luther King? No, I couldn't get it. Out. Okay, so I took a small edible before we started recording. <laughs> and, you know, words, I'm fighting them a little bit. Well, because, I mean, I, honestly, I thought you were just hung up on Martin Luther <laughs> because this, this is about religion. No, no, they keep, well, they do drop, they drop a quote of his where it's every, I, every I didn't time, mean to let you hang out there. I thought you were. No, I was like, I was trapped in like circular time. I couldn't get out of it. Um, they drop a quote where every time God builds a church, the devil builds a chapel. Every time God closes a door, he opens a window. That's not a real. Are you kidding me? Martin Luther King Jr.? <laughs> don't, don't, I, you can't <laughs> handle the weed, man. Oh, dude, it was 2.5 milligrams. I Are was you not kidding me? No, I'm not. It was a mint. That's nothing. Dude, I got those dude, mints. Shut up, Randy. <laughs> Yo. I popped 20, one this morning. 20 millis? Oh. 20 millis does nothing to me anymore, dude. 20 milli vanilla? 20 milli Clark, dude. <laughs> does nothing. Doesn't make a dent. Yeah. So I, I all the horror fans that are reading all those reviews, I'm saying take a shot on this movie. There's some interesting shit. And the Avengers like um, religious team is kind of fun. But my man, boy, Bill Sadler's in this. Yeah. I the cast felt very weighty. Now, you've buried the lead here. What? The girl who plays. Yeah, I didn't know who she was. Yeah. Well, her name is Cricket Brown. Yeah. Come on. Well, she also feels like um, somebody. Like she's got that. <laughs> she's got that star quality. Well, with a name like Cricket Brown. Yeah, I don't know. She was good. She can sing. Too, Cricket maybe. Brown. That sounds like a username on Eight Chan, <laughs> <laughs> which is not a thing because it's all anonymous. So ignore what I just said. Okay, Reddit. Yeah, Randy, <laughs> cut that up. <laughs> where it sounds like I said Reddit. Randy, bleep it <laughs> instead of Eight Chan. Her legal name is Julie Ann Taylor. Where did Cricket Brown come from? She is Thanks, also Andy. credited as Julie Pickerling, Gene Howard, oh. and Cricket Brown. Did you say Meat Howard? Gene Howard. <laughs> Dude, Meat Howard? That's what a good thing. What are we watching? Okay. Her so, Oksana? Her website is her dancing with the dude in the dress, and she's dressed as, is she dressed as Art Garfunkel? She's got a good mustache going. All right, again, on YouTube. Wait, Oksana, how far behind on YouTube are we? I don't know. <laughs> Stop playing videos, then. We got to catch up. Um. Anyway, The Unholy was, I don't know. It, how many stars? There were a few people in there, too. Ah, uh, Probably three, maybe three and a half. Oh, it's a three-star movie, which I'm means just, one star, because Russell's ratings are weird. No, it's just, uh, I had, it was entertaining. I would totally forget about it. Except for the weird journalist thing. I feel like I'm going to remember that. It's got a really weird... 
Actually, I kind of like it where it's like it punishes. And, well, I mean, I don't want to ruin it. Like there's more that happens, yeah. but it, yeah, it would ruin the plot. All when right. you watch it, we could talk about it. All right, let's do it. Uh, let's get to the last movie. Okay. Um, you want me to intro it? Yes. So, um, Charles Barkley, uh, during, uh, his last broadcast got on a screed about the current condition of, uh, our planet. And he was talking about race relations. And he mentioned that in his heart, he feels that most white people and black people are just good. And the media is blowing this shit out of proportion and it's really unhealthy, but he just wanted everybody to know that we got to drop this shit. We I, gotta need, stop I fighting need with you each to other. redo that in a Charles Barkley. No, voice. I can't. <laughs> Um, the, knucklehead. Now, the reason I, I wanted to open with that when we we're about to talk about Bad Trip, the new Eric Andre movie, is because I don't know if you knew, but I had four tears during this movie. I got deeply emotional while watching this. And later that night, I thought about it more and it made me tear up again. You teared up watching this Bad movie. Trip. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you right now. It's it's a comedy and it's um in the stylings of Borat where um. People are kind of at the mercy of a movie happening, or, or a jackass, or yeah, jackass. or bad grandpa, yeah. whatever. Yeah, or bad grandpa, or um, actually, it's no, it's not. Yeah, a Borat, I think, is the closest, just because it's or an impractical Joker. No, Boo. I, yeah, <laughs> dude, they're post, uh, like they're back now, and um, in the COVID world, it's so not funny. Like, I'm an impractical Joker's fan, but now they're doing weird, like. Because, you know, they have to be PC, so everybody's so fucking socially distanced on that show. Yeah. It's weird. And I, I, much like this movie, you need a crowd. You need people. Like, Yeah, that's a, that's why I told you. I watched the first 15 to 20 minutes of this, and I said, I need to watch this. Well, with I, I, don't, I don't mean in the room. I just mean on the screen. Like, this movie wouldn't work if there weren't a crowd on the street. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but also, yeah, no, watching this with friends was a great idea. It, um... I feel like I would have laughed out loud anyway, though. And again, the, the reason I teared up is not because there's it's, you know, like a drama or anything. This is the most pro human movie I've watched in a very long time. And it was like it was affecting me in a weird way. It so the thing, you know, I always complain about woke shit because, you know, I love everybody and I fucking assault them with the L word. Like I'm, I'm talking about guests or friends on the show. And you know what? I mean it. And in this movie, they kind of tee up what would be a, like, brutally, brutally, like, woke segment. And it, I'm just like, dude, Eric, don't do it. Like, And I'm talking about, like, they go to a, a country club, and they're like, we're the only two black guys in here. I'll tell you, if you were about to root for how racist white people are, and you were ready to just, like, teach them a lesson with this movie— the only the complete opposite happens at every turn in the okay, film. Okay. Well, we, all right. <laughs> what? <laughs> you said country club. It, well, that's what, what you they... meant to say was a honky tonk bar. Yeah, yeah. Those are two wildly <laughs> I, I different it, things. It. Remember, a country club <laughs> is a private <laughs> club oh, for you're playing right. golf and high society. They were in a, a dive. They're in a honk. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there there was um oh God, I want to call it four square. What the hell you call it? Line dancing happening on their under their disco ball. Yeah, it was man. that kind of club. And uh these like much like Bad Grandpa or Jackass, um, Eric Andre is mostly bringing trouble whenever you're near him. Yeah. And at every fucking point in this movie, the they don't I, I don't know if it's just selection of footage, but everybody reacts like in a helpful manner. Even when it looks like a convict is breaking out. And I'll tell you, there's, there's moments where, like, shit happens. Like, maybe a car gets wrecked. And somebody's just like, hey, man, get the fuck out of here. And it's that, it's that people versus the government kind of thing that I love. Where they're like, don't let the police get involved. Just go. Like, Well, my favorite was when Tiffany Haddish escaped out of jail. Yeah. Where she's coming out from under the bus, and the guy's like, because <laughs> yeah. he's got a vest on. You think maybe he's doing community <laughs> service. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, go. Get out of here. No, th at every point in this movie. <laughs> it's so good. But at every point, like, again, like, if you listen to as much fucking politics or watch the news as much as I do, the the world they paint 
is the complete opposite of this. It is like if you fell down in the street, people would spit on you as they walked by if you're lucky. Yeah. Where in this world, in the real world, everybody's fucking helping everybody out. And it doesn't matter what you look like or what you're doing. Even if you're completely in the wrong, fucking drunk, puking all over the place. People still rush up and try and help. I don't know, man. It moved me. Well, I think it's also a, a point of editing because, you know, a Borat would not show that side. That doesn't help the narrative with Borat. That's what I mean. I, it could be film selection, but also it's just creative intent. Yeah. Like Borat, that dude, I loved the first Borat movie, yeah. which was kind of about how, you know, Americans treat foreigners. Part two is clearly about how dumb the South is and how. Yeah. And it's like man fuck you like that's half of the country they're not evil people you know like i'm so tired of that shit yeah i don't dude i randy did you cry <laughs> i didn't but i 100 percent get what you're saying just like even like the first time is like him at the with the car and is uh the vacuum like vacuums his clothes off or whatever yeah mm -hmm. just like yeah it's like what what do you do in that situation you're not gonna like run away you know like it's right. like you gotta you gotta handle it you're gonna help this person out and i found that very moving for sure i definitely was hyped for this movie um i don't know if you guys know that it leaked in like april of last year it was on amazon prime for a minute oh for one day right yeah and a podcast that i listened to um they saw it then and they talked about it like back yeah in like late april so i've been uh looking forward to it and it definitely lived up to expectations for sure yeah randy we were talking about trying to get it for us like that's what i heard yeah this movie's too big <laughs> for our fest sure but we're like the, the way that so the other thing that i liked about um bad trip that borat didn't do or bad grandpa is they really made fun of the studio parameters of filmmaking like there's a moment in this movie where a musical happens oh my god right and it's that like that was my thing <laughs> yeah. that is when i when it clicked on for this movie because as i because, you know, obviously that's where it took a different turn for me because these sort of things are a little formulaic, mm -hmm. like with a bad grandpa, like these things, for sure. like we know where it's headed, even with like action park to some extent, because they kind of like, you know, did the stunts. But anyway, um, anything Jeff Tremaine, I almost like went action same. park too. And I felt my conversation <laughs> yeah. <from> dying, <laughs> but, um, that's really Man, when the musical kicked in, and then like he brought in like dancers and everything, and just to see, like the reactions were were uh, how they edited those were fun, but that is when this movie clicked a different gear for me. Well, it's the reverse of like Borat, where Borat's all about like this movie is reality. Yeah, where in that it's reality. Welcome to a movie. Like everything was like a dramatic like like this girl cannot rip a door off a police car. But in the movie, it would. <laughs> but then you have people reacting like, you know, it's real life. So they're yeah. like, how the fuck? I thought that was weird. And the musical, if it didn't open up with the perfect dude on that bench, that dude, oh. he was one of the ones that made me emotional where he was just like, go for it. You, you want to know what really killed me? Actually, it's kind of getting me right now. Uh, the third act, that bouncer. Oh, dude, that fucked me up. Now, see, that was... <sighs> When the bouncer happened, I started to think, was this was this staged? I don't with think the so. bouncer? Is he an actor? Now, I I was listening to a podcast, uh, philosophy one. I'm I'm getting into those. And they were talking about um the difference between a uh, storytelling and using the um the hero uh journey, right? Like the there's a reason the hero's journey appears all the time, from like Star Wars to the Bible. And uh, they're talking about a good sermon and you really try to tap into that hero's journey. And it's the difference between somebody telling you a story of their night out and somebody describing items in your bedroom to you. Because when somebody tells you a story, you're like, OK, that's cool. And maybe you weigh their character or you think about like, oh, the, you know, they're talking about a wrestling event. They're more informed in that sport than I am. Like, it's different. But when somebody's telling you about your lamp and like where your wallet was, your reaction is, when were you in my room? And when I when I heard or when I watched it unfold with that bouncer, it's like, dude, I've been there where it's like I'm doing my job and I'm like, you can't break me. But then, you know, somebody pleads in like a real way. Yeah. And it's like, man, you know what? Fuck it, dude. 
That like I've so been there. Good. It felt so true to me. Yeah. And also you could tell that motherfucker did not want to let him in. And Eric Andre was doing the kind of Borat thing where it's, he's kind of disheveled looking and he's getting into what looked like a high end gallery. Yeah. But he just told the dude like, man, I'm in love. Like, you gotta let me and oh man it fucked me up i'm telling you brought in the guy from the street was in there too the guy got in there too (laughs) but it just oh man dude this movie made me way too emotional so yesterday i saw something on uh youtube from netflix's comedy account netflix is a joke or netflix is not a joke whatever that (laughs) i have no idea um and it was bad trip the deleted scenes Mm. 10 minutes um, a deleted scene. Chris Rock was in this film as a, a highway patrolman, oh. but the bit didn't work because he's Chris Rock and was exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but they did. He riffed on it anyway, so they. Um, it's in the deleted scenes. But my the best part of the deleted scenes was they go to back to the bar where Eric Andre's pissing everywhere, and the guy throws the shot glass down. Yeah, was, yeah. They show that whole scene of um, beforehand. They show Eric Andre d- testing out the ping Wait, device. You, can you set that scene up? Okay. So, yeah. well, yeah. But so essentially behind the scenes is uh, Eric Andre's at this bar and he needs to, and he's uh, pissing all over the place. He's got a fake little pee yeah. apparatus. Yeah. So they're testing that out. And then Eric Andre says, okay, so if people get mad that I'm peeing on them, our safe word is popcorn, right? And he said, oh, yeah, popcorn. And so he goes up to the bar and he's, he's peeing in the, this, there's this very tough looking gentleman <laughs> at the bar who says, I don't care where you pee, but you're not going to pee near me. And he's, but Eric Andre just keeps going. He's like, no, man, we could be friends. Like let's play pool. And he's like, I'm giving you a chance, buddy. <laughs> go and then and then he he said all right i guess he's just not listening he took a shot (laughs) and that dude it was like straight out of a clint eastwood movie he took a shot threw the shot glass on the ground and went to go kick eric andre's hand (laughs) and eric andre's just going popcorn 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 (laughs) and then a swarm of people show up and then they tell him and then it cuts to him saying well your actor almost spent a night in the hospital (laughs) But then he shows him like he's hugging him and he's like, what, what kind of shot can I buy you, buddy? <laughs> and he's like, Jim Beam. He's like, you're, you're fucking drinking Jim Beam. You're a goddamn <laughs> redneck from Carolina like me. And so they, it all worked I, out. Again, now I didn't, that guy didn't strike me as like a tough guy, but he struck me as one of those dudes where it's like. there You saw the, the crazy guy. in his yeah, eyes, it's, man. Cause you know, there can be like some wiry dudes who are like you're like oh i shouldn't fuck with him and it's not because they know how to fight or have a weapon you can tell it's just like they don't have nothing else yeah and it's like all i have is is my honor which means nothing in 2021 but i'm gonna fight for it and it's like dude yeah i don't know i i don't know it's weird how emotional i got you know what else got me the fucking army guy well he was oh the army guy he was so i felt he may i may have felt worse for him than anyone else but look at how he reacted yeah like you want well, to stereotype army, yeah but like in what state he's an army recruiter I, in what now state? i heard that guy who's the army recruiter in the movie we're talking about has a level q clearance oh really that's what i heard <laughs> fuck yeah man. <laughs> speak for that what you will dude if all those q guys are that chill then uh dude randy randy do you get any like what'd you get out of this movie I mean, you summed it up better than I could say it, you know? All right. I don't, I, I don't I get emotional like, during any movie, pretty much, but I appreciated wait, wait. it. I The thing is, I know I come on here and I bitch about movies like Antebellum and things that I think are like race baiting. Like, I, the horror genre had a whole swath. Like, I don't even think we're out of it of white devil movies where I'm like, you know, when you're when you're expressing like an existential horror even if I can't personally relate to it, I can understand. But when you're just fucking Borat out there, and like the thing is, I saw all the footage from that Freedom um, rally he went to, and I saw what they used for the movie, and I'm like, dude, you're just pouring gasoline on this shit. And it, I mean, honestly, it propelled him. That clip of him talking to Trump, 
shot the fuck up. Nobody was watching that thing until after that movie came out. And then it had millions of views. But like to come into ah, the other thing is I really like Eric Andre and I'm glad yeah. that like like I well, we've watched him on Tim's um podcast. What the fuck is that radio show called with Tim Heidecker? Uh Office Hours. Office Hours. And like I don't know, Eric Andre seems like such a like just like a dork, like but a cool dude. I'm so happy that I can like double down on feeling good about him. <laughs> I, of course he's great and then also, you know, how good was Lil Rel and Tiffany Haddish? Oh, they dude. were great. See, Tiffany Haddish was great in this movie. Also, again, just I love Lil Rel. Poking Bud fun at, Malone. <laughs> dude, the studio system shit though, like <laughs> making a musical happen in a way where people are you know, like subjectively kind of like what is happening. <laughs> I mean, we live in a world where like flash dances or what What do they call those? Flash mob. Flash mobs are a thing. So, I mean, it's not that weird. But when they were when they were making fun or like, you know, a talking point in this movie is fucking um, white girls. Is that it? Oh, yeah. white girls. So white girls. And then when I flipped out. No, no. Hold on. I'm not talking about uh, the thing you're thinking of. <laughs> I'm just, I love the idea of two friends talking about like this stupid Wayne's movie. Like that could never work, which is a conversation that anybody who's ever seen that white movie, chicks. white chicks, there we go. I always get that name wrong. Um, I always think of fucking, uh, what the hell is that? I don't know. Whatever. I I'm sorry. That, again, I'm not taking any more. I saw that theatrically. Did you? <laughs> I did. In Conway, Arkansas. How was it? Not good. No, I mean the theater. I think there were four people there. Oh, see, I saw, um, oh my God. What was the sequel to Friday called? Next Friday. I think it was next Friday. I saw that in the theater and I, uh, they would have got a complaint from the HOA too, with all the weed smoke in that damn theater. And I'm talking at <laughs> daily city. Like it was a fucking party in there. So I'm, I was almost hoping you had something like that going for no, a, no, no. Th I mean, you know, I'm a matinee man. Oh hell yeah! yeah. You yourself. If you're going to see white chicks at matinee <laughs> time, fuck, you needed weed earlier. I saw in white chicks at eleven <laughs> a probably, dude. Anyway, I love the dialogue that they have about this could never really happen, and you know you're kind of like, okay, at what point are they going to like don the uniform? But what they actually do first is they don a gorilla suit, <laughs> and which is <sighs> which is by far harder to believe. Yeah, you, like we were watching it and we're like, this can't be real. But then you, it's like, no, it's real. I mean, that suit looked fucking great. I've seen movies that didn't have that kind of quality costume, especially at a distance. Like, yeah, but at some point the jig had to be up because of how ridiculous <laughs> they were with the act. I mean, they probably had multiple cameras and made it feel longer than it was in real life. Yeah, for sure. But dude. Those people believed it. Oh, man. And you can tell in the end credits. Also, when... how shitty did that zoo look? <laughs> yeah, I, well, again, I've only lived in the Bay Area. Man, and I we love have a zoos. Great, I've been to the San Francisco Zoo and the San Diego Zoo. So my bar is pretty high, I yeah. think. That zoo looked like it needed to be condemned. I was worried about those damn animals in there. They, they, they were like pens on hills. Like there was no paved. I don't know. Yeah, that zoo looked like a fucking nightmare. Yeah, I like that movie. Bad trip, four and a half stars. Four and what? Why did it lose a half? We can talk about that later. Come on, give it. Why? You wanted like nudity. <laughs> Wait, there is nudity. There's a Chinese finger trap. Yeah, there's no. some stretchy dicks in there. <laughs> oh, dude, the finger trap thing. They got a knife pulled on them by dude, a barber. Yeah. Even so, even the, another example. That dude on the golf course. He was like, hey, I'll have, like now. I mean, as far as stereotypes go, you think the white lame ass in a polo playing golf alone would be instantly like fucking cruel to two black dudes coming up with their wieners in a Chinese finger trap. <laughs> and he was like, OK. And he heard him out and he was helping him. It wasn't until he called him. What did he call him? He called him a name, and then it he flipped, and he and, went, get the fuck out of here. And then Eric Andre said, you turned on us. Yeah, you turned on us. <laughs> He's like, fuck you. Yeah. What did they, he called him something? I don't remember. Randy, do you remember? No, I don't remember either. Something oh. caused the turn. He called him, He and I mean, obviously, he was trying to push his buttons, but it was like, I was just so happy. I'm like, dude, even this motherfucker, he would have helped him out, like, and you, and you walk up to somebody out on here on the street, and yeah. they would say, no way. He's a racist piece of shit. He'd 
run him over with this golf cart or whatever. I don't know. Love that trip. Brandon, what would you write this? Four, baby. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> That's good for me. That's pretty good. I don't, I don't get it. Randy, are you operating on the five is a perfect movie? Sort of. What the fuck is a perfect movie? Transit? Uh, Maybe. I don't know. I don't remember what I rated it. Tenant? No, that's a two. <laughs> Tree of Life. Tenant got a two. Tree of Life's a five. Hey, which one yeah. of you which one of you tweeted out that tenant criterion cover? <laughs> that was me. That was Randy. Dude. That was good. That I re I, I mean, I I'm I'm uh, having a a breakup with social media currently and I I vaguely go on it. Mm -hmm. That made me go back to Twitter like three or four times. <laughs> That was pretty good. Yeah, uh, go on Twitter. We're at the Overlook Hour. Uh, it's worth it. Oh, speaking of Criterion News, uh, let's get a quick Criterion News segment here. Oh, God. Hold on. Criterion News. MMI. What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Randy, they are releasing a Blu-ray of Memories of Murder on Criterion this month. Yeah, dude. That's old news. <laughs> MMI. This concludes <laughs> Criterion Update. <laughs> All right, enjoy the interview. <laughs> and we'll see you next week. The virus. Crystal clear. Perfecto. Yeah, we were uh we were just watching outsider stand up comedy while we were while we were waiting. <laughs> oh nice. What is that? What is outsider stand up well, comedy? Well, I mean, I just you know, have you are you familiar with like outsider art? No, tell me. Is that what I make? No, it's kind of <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, people who shouldn't be um putting paintings on Etsy who are doing it and they get popular because it's it's so different and like I don't there's a dude who lives in Casper, Wyoming, who dresses like a gothic oh god, how would you describe him? A gothic Chris Rock. No, no. Chris kid Rock. Rock. Kid Rock. A gothic <laughs> yeah, not Chris Rock. Yeah, a gothic kid kid rock who um puts wands that he makes on Etsy. So he walks around Wyoming picking up stick and then he'll glue like crystals to the end of them. And he wraps them in copper wire and he sells them on Etsy. And then he also records music and does freestyle rap. And he does it all like on live stream. And so like um, an outsider stand up would be like your local librarian to stand up about <laughs> reselling books. Pretty much. I mean, you know, it's, I mean, I, when you apply that to stand up, it's a little tricky because, you know, open mics are just, I mean, that's the breeding ground for all that shit. So, yeah, I hate stand up comedy. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Clark, I mean, look, there are like, there are like six people who are amazing at it, and then the other two billion people on earth who want to try. No, I'm with you. I, as a as a recovering stand up comedian myself, I I fully understand. So me these things, I tell them, I was like, dude, I have PTSD from this, from just uh, having years in open mics, man. It's it's rough stuff. It it wears your soul down. And by the way, I wrote a feature and produced a feature film about a stand up comic. So I'm not just like you know being grumpy. Like I, I actually. I actually made a whole film about a stand up comic. <laughs> You've done the legwork. You've got the ground to stand up. Yes, and which also meant I worked with a stand-up comic to make the film. What, what was the movie? <laughs> it's called Before the Sun Explodes, and you can um, all stream it on Amazon Prime. Oh, awesome. Yeah, it's, um, I did not direct it. I wrote and produced it, and um, it's very well directed. Um, it's a very low-budget feature. It, um, it premiered at um, South by Southwest in like 2016, I want to say, something like that. Um, but I, I recommend it. It was very well directed film, and the actors are great. So, did you hate stand up comedy before you wrote this, or because of your experience with the film, you hate stand up comedy now? It, it's weird. I, I, I mean, I don't hate stand up comedy, and it, like, there are some people who I think are very, very funny, including Bill Dawes, who stars in the film, who's a, a stand up comic, but also was 
an actor before he became a stand-up comic and now he's kind of brilliant both he's he's great but it's just not my form like it's it just it's it, to me it's just like contrived i see like the whole whole of everything as it's happening sure um and sometimes it's really really funny but like to me like a night out isn't like going and watching stand up like it's i don't know oh i agree with you <laughs> I agree with you. I, it was one of those things where I was like, you know, I'm glad people are in the club, but this is not right. how I would spend my time. <laughs> That's right. And then I wrote the movie about it. So actually me and Deborah, who directed it, we went and um, watched a lot of stand-ups like to like prepare. And, and Bill, we kind of knew was going to be in the movie as we were writing it. So he has a lot of stuff up on YouTube. So I watched like, a, and I, I've known Bill for, for decades um so i was familiar with his stuff but you know it's it's fine like i don't hate stand-up comedy it's just like it's just not enough for me that's really weird i never thought about that like i i five years ago would have said i do hate stand-up comedy and i mean as like a live art because i i never wanted to be in the room because i always had fear that they would like you know single me out and i'd be like oh great here's what i don't want to be as part of this show Oh my God. Audience participation is my biggest fear. <laughs> oh my God. I, I say, I say that all the time. My biggest fear is to be chosen to, to be, a, I went to a play like right before the pandemic, like literally like March 6th, 2020. And it was a Sunday night and the play was called home. And it was like this play that had like originated at the Berkeley rep. And it, it was, you know, being toured around the country. It was like this like hot, like experimental theater piece. And like oh, no. 10 minutes in, like they start inviting people like up onto the stage to be like part of the play. And it turns out that was the whole concept for the whole play. Like eventually, <laughs> literally like half the audience was like incorporated into the stage. And I was just like, like, I was, I had such angst. It was so crazy. I th- I mean, um, what what was the play? Tony and Tina's wedding? Is that right? No, it, no, it was, it, I think it was called Home. Okay. It was like, like. It was like a piece of like like important experimental theater originally produced by the Berkeley Rep. You know, it was like you know, it was like heady theater. But yeah. It was like all audience participation, <laughs> and it's like no, not me. I, yeah. And then there's this thing on Hulu, the magician, you know, who like tells the one story about his mom and and then admits to having like cheated at cards and like you know. Yeah. That's like the whole thing. Um, and you succinctly <laughs> summarized. Right? I mean, like, look, I can like, the, it took him like an hour and 20 minutes to tell the story and I can tell it in like 15 seconds. But, um, but like, I can't imagine going to a piece of theater like that. Like, it's like, like you are humble. You are, you are an extrovert. You are an eyewitness. Like when he like, I was just like, oh, it's so stupid. I feel like that kind of performance art is also like on the rise too. I know. How can we stop it? <laughs> well, uh, Phil Rosenthal, who created um, Everybody Loves yeah, Raymond. Everybody Loves Raymond, yeah. who I just saw the other night in person. That's so weird. Yes. <laughs> what, what about Phil? But, but I, so think, I think, I think, I, is it Tony and Tina's wedding? Is that the thing he made? It was like. Did he make Tony? We can blame him for Tony and Tina's wedding. Is that the name of the. Yeah, I think that's what it's called. Where essentially, like, if you're in, you you are a part of the play as you are in the audience. You're in that's, the. That's uh, right. You spend seventy five dollars, fifteen of which goes to like a shitty plate of meatballs and like a glass of Chianti, and you're like part of the wedding party. It was in New York City. It was like Cats. It was like forever in New York City. Tony T- and then they franchised it throughout the country. Yeah, that was Phil, Phil Rosenthal. I believe we can blame Phil Rosenthal. Oh for my god. <laughs> and now you know yep, there you go phil yeah. rosenthal but now somebody just needs to feed him and uh he's well he does not he, he does not need anybody to feed him <laughs> that is also true. yeah so with stand-up oh, comedy okay. like the first incarnation of this shit where it's like hey you know maybe my prepared comedy like the prepared act wasn't that great but i know how to be mean to people well, I mean, you could probably trace it back to fucking, you know, court gestures and all that bullshit. But <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I think in terms of, you know, American comedy, you know, it all goes back to, you know, the Catskills and, and vaudeville and all that stuff. Yeah. And I, yeah, it, yeah, definitely. And I, it, I yeah, I, I'm sure it must have. I mean, at least, yeah, in America it must have its roots in, in vaudeville. But like, 
Um, but, Zeke, we lose you. But I have to say, I have much more respect for like a, so. for the stand up comedy <laughs> in the era when it really Dude, was really like an outsiders. Now. We're like, Damn. all right, you we'll know, just like reconnect with. The, do we have to know, send like, them a new the, link, like, or can we just like, reconnect of, to that of, one? Like stand up of like the seventies, like Phyllis Diller. Like, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I don't know if his like, internet went down or what. Amazing, Joan Rivers. We should just be able to use the same link. Oh, they were such outsiders. What's that? Well, uh, Zeke, 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 Zeke. We, we lost you for about 45 seconds. 45 seconds? I know. I'm not going to repeat it. I'm just... I'm just saying that, like, when there was, like, out, like true outsiders, like, like the women who rose in the, like, 1970s, like Phyllis Diller and, like, Joan Rivers, like, and they were true, like, kind of ground bla- blazers. Did you say ground blazers? Trailblazers. Trailblazers. There we go. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just had to... Like, I just thought they were actually like like it was almost like political what they were doing like women you know like it was almost like acts of, uh, an act of feminism for women to like do i guess it still is because like comedy is so sexist but like uh, well, I don't sure. know. what no- do you what do you mean by that can you expound on that i'm just can i uh, expound on that yeah well, just like- I, I well just in general like the art world is like sexist my, you know i grew up my mom is a painter like the first of all the visual art world has like it i've i've experienced secondhand through my mother and seen it my whole life how sexist the visual art world is like it's incredible like all of the all of the artists represented by galleries in the 1980s and so they were like all men like and not all men but like it was it's such a male driven world and that extends into into everything like i've i've written and produced three films directed by women and the the sexism that you experience when you uh, take a film to festivals with women is so ingrained into the culture of film festivals I, i'm not saying your film festival uh, but <laughs> Well, because be. you, I don't know. Played, you, you played uh, Jillian Horvath's amazing film as your opening night, and I love Jillian. She's incredible, and um, and uh, she made a wonderful film. Man, how incredible is she? Let's give her props on her. Oh, podcast. for sure, indeed. Um, I, I I adore her, but like. I don't know if you, I, I did not listen to her episode. I don't know if she spoke about sexism in the, in the film festival circuit. Um, oh, and I can't I, really do. Yeah. I'm not going to speak for the experience of like the women I've, you know, I've worked with or haven't worked with, but like secondhand having written and produced movies with women directors, like it is blatant. Yeah. I'm just, I, you know, I had to ask because when I imagine art going up in a gallery, it seems like it would just be on the consumer. Like it's just a product. So you would weigh it on its merit and I can't imagine, but, I don't know the industry that well. Gatekeepers. There are gatekeepers in every industry. People are deciding who gets seen. It's true of everything. It's true of like comedy. It's true of film. It's true of art. Like you have to go to somewhere with your portfolio and show someone. You have to walk into a gallery, you know, in in the, I'm talking like in the 1980s, you would go around like an actor going to auditions. You would go with your portfolio and you would either drop off a portfolio or slides or whatever. Like you had to go in person. And if you were a woman walking in, I just don't think you were taken seriously like a man. And if that starts when you're like out of art school and you're 24 years old, it becomes exponential over the years how a man's career is going to grow versus a woman because once you get your first credit you know suddenly you're like legitimized in a way and then other people think you're good whether or not you are and like uh your career is just going to kind of have more opportunities faster the faster you have your first break and women just don't get that um and like open mic doesn't provide a platform for <laughs> female comedians <laughs> it totally it totally does and i think i i was going to say that i think there are two places where there's a bit of exception which is comedy and music because like in in music like you're actually if somebody like goes and like sings this song at like a carry you know karaoke is like weird but like you know <laughs> like like you're actually experiencing the art like in in the in the moment but like i still think it's i still of course comedy is sexist like it's like it they're boys clubs that run these comedy clubs Oh, for sure. No, it totally makes sense to me now. Like, 
I you you painted an image in my head of a uh, lady walking in with a bunch of canvases under her arm and pitching it to a art gallery. And it's yeah. maybe it's like unique and weird. And they're like, well, clearly she can't be a tastemaker. That makes sense to me. But now that we're talking about open mic, it makes me feel kind of bad because I almost feel like as a as admitting that I don't want to go to open mic especially out where like Clark was doing stand up before which seems abysmal and depressing i uh, confirmed i it, i almost am demanding the a product without actually partaking in any of the culture like if you're a fan of comedy should you be going to stand up like open mic nights incorrect right. <laughs> Right. And and there you go. And there are filters and gatekeepers which are filtering to you the final like decision arbiter of this is comedy right now. Right. And if there is and I'm not saying like the sexism is necessarily overt or conscious on people's parts. Um, I'm, I'm sure it is on some people's parts, but not on everybody's part. It's just cultural like our our culture is sexist (laughs) like and we're trying to change that and being conscious of it is like how we can change it you know yeah i think i'm a little skewed in my personal life just because i've grown up and clark always loves to mention like i haven't gotten out of the bay area very much and it's kind of been all around me my whole life so whenever i hear things like little bubble boy yeah I'm in like a yeah. coastal elite bubble I, and I'm really trying to break it, but yeah, but you know what? Like I'm just going to put out there and you can think about this on your own time whenever you would like, but like even at an unnamed movie theater and that showed exclusively independent films, like on, you know, in Hollywood, in Los Angeles, there was a huge scandal not five years ago about like sexual harassment in the workplace. And, and this is like, you know, in the bubble. These are like the cultural elite of like film festival, like programming at a, you know, at a live screening movie theater in Los Angeles. And basically the theater shut down because like the expose of this sexual harassment in the workplace. So like, even in our bubble, like, I don't think, like, I know we all like to think that like, we don't have isms, but like, I think we all need to like, just be conscious of them. Like we admit to them when other people point them out and point them out to each other and not feel defensive when they're pointed out to us, you know, be like, yes, that's true. And like, I hadn't thought about it that way before I spoke and, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we can all just, you know, be a little kinder to each other. Yeah, no, you're totally right. And I've been humbled in public before. I'm a... I've learned to, you know, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a thing you got to move with, but I'm also weary of like the arbiters of inclusiveness. Like a lot of the times, those are the ones who you get like all the DMs start leaking and you're like, Oh, you were, you were like fronting this whole time. And- I under, yes, I understand that also. I think, I think it's a cultural shift in that if we focus too much on the anecdotal individual, like we get just like trapped in the weeds where that wasn't fair to that person. That wasn't fair to that person. The, this person's on the right side. Like, and I don't want to be having that argument. I just want everybody to start kind of thinking in new ways. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Dude, Z, have you ever done stand up? Oh, God, no. You're incredibly funny, though. Like, it's natural. Yeah, see, I couldn't, to me, first of all, the fear. Second of all, like, I, I could, I, I'm sure I could write a set of stand up, but the thought of sitting down and figuring it out yeah. and the practice it takes and the honing of the jokes and, and then going to all the open mics to like do the set that will eventually be great, but it's going to be bad 30 times before it's going to be great. Like, I don't see that's the thing. I, uh, like, Russ, to your point, yeah, yes. Funny is just a very small part of it. There, yeah, are, yeah. there are very funny people that just aren't good stand-ups. Uh, one of which is yeah. sitting in front of you right now, Russell. <laughs> and, um, I mean, I, I, I have severe commitment issues, so that's why I bail on stand-up. But the, the thing is, is that like with Zeke, like how are you with shame, Zeke? <laughs> with what? With shame. Oh, with shame? Yeah. Does it? Does it? Is yeah. it a big weight on you? Like, mm, well. I would say. I don't <laughs> also, know. welcome to the podcast. Uh, my name's Russell. That's Clark. Oh, yeah. Shall we begin? <laughs> we um, wanted to bring you here on Easter to talk about shame and how you deal. Talk about shame. No, I'm not like a, a, a. It's not. I'm not. I would say this. I think I'm better suited for improvisation than I am to stand up. It's actually 
I would say lazy, not laziness. It's just, I'm very focused when I'm like writing screenplays and I'm very focused when I'm like in the moment, like faux acting. I'm not, I don't think, I don't call myself an actor, but like I can be in my movies and be a version of myself, I guess, in a Seinfeld kind of way, but not to compare myself to him. Because he's, <laughs> he's terrible. Talk about like one of the least funny standups. Um, <laughs> I agree. Um, but I'm much better than Jerry Seinfeld, I, and I'm much better at being myself, acting like myself. <laughs> you know, it's a bummer. Um, I'm a huge Seinfeld fan of the sitcom. Me too. And when me too. Yeah. Um, Stand up. I was like, yeah. I, terrible. What happened? Like, I, I would I have found this funny like ten years ago? Well, he I, did a nice uh, parody of Secret Agent Man, oh. <laughs> where he jumped out of a helicopter. God. Oh, did he? Oh, yeah. Oh. That's how he opened up his stand up special. Oh. oh, he's so self. <laughs> interested and loving oh loving he, so much he cares nothing about uh society it's he's so self-involved it it, <laughs> it is wild it's wild how self-involved he is i saw him he, he did like a 60 in, minutes interview after the whole new york is dead new york isn't dead kind of thing oh, yeah. Yeah. minutes it is the most navel gazing interview <laughs> I have ever Man. seen. And he starts telling these jokes in it that are like so not funny that even like the 60 minutes interviewer is like giving him nothing. <laughs> it's like yeah. really sad. Well, after Larry King died, a lot of people were playing the clip when he was on the show and he was so offended that Larry had no idea how that if he was canceled or not. Yeah. And I, and everybody was I mean the context I always heard it come up in was how um of an everyday man Larry was and you know he was just asking questions that everybody would want to know and to me I walked away with that with like goddamn Jerry Seinfeld's like an egomaniac <laughs> but, oh he's crazy yeah he is like he's like such an egomaniac that like it's like he does it in such a like almost subdued way like I like egomaniacs. My breed of e <laughs> the, the kind of egomaniac that I am, because I am not excluding myself. To all my friends listening, I am not excluding myself as an egomaniac. Um, I am so self aware of it, and yeah. that's where my humor comes from. Is like the self the indulgence in my self indulgence. Um, Understood completely. Some of, some of my humor, and I would say for me, I'm much better su suited to improvisation than I am to stand up comedian. Although I you would have to drag me to an improv show. Um, like some of, uh, some of my favorite parts of possession I, possessions was pretty much completely scripted, but there are a few moments in it, which are not scripted, which um, were just improvised. But when I improvise in my own films, I think of it as being scripted because it's actually me writing it. So I'm still scripting it because even though it's me, if it's me doing the improv, I'm writing it. I'm just like doing like fixes, like on set, like in person. So now, okay. Uh, what was it only last weekend? We did the film fest. I know. It feels like a month ago, at least. Was it last week? I think it was last weekend. <laughs> That's not, I'm not joking. Um, so we, yeah, at the unnamed footage festival, 24 hour, uh, what was the eight other? Fundraiser. Yeah. Fundraiser. <laughs> okay. So did you check it out? See? I did. I did. I wasn't able. I was. I was in and out because I um. I, I had work and other things. But yes, I did check. Wait, it out. you didn't I, stick around for the twenty four hours straight? <laughs> I did not. I did not. I will have to be honest with you because here's here's the thing. When I, I I would love to be able to lie about things. The problem isn't that I'm a bad. The problem isn't that I'm a bad liar. The problem is is that like when I lie, like those are the only things anybody ever calls me on. Like, <laughs> like inadvertently, like I just like, I just get trapped in my own lies. And I, I, I that is the worst. So, yeah, no, that's the problem with life. <laughs> yeah. That's the problem you get trapped. Now, um, I mean, it's pretty interesting. We were talking about art and gatekeeping. And one of the things I was worried about with the fest was that we were, we, we were a film fest essentially regularly, but this year we did yeah. a one time live stream. And I, I was conflicted with how much as programmers we were putting ourselves in front of the camera. And after, you know, talking about art galleries and kind of just, you know, gatekeepers being kind of self-motivated or, you know, just like bigoted in weird ways. I almost think what we did is good now. Like there's I, a level of I transparency. Agree. A thousand percent. Oh, I just said a thousand percent. I'm sorry. That's the worst. <laughs> 
<laughs> Clark went home for uh, what Thanksgiving, and your mom called you out on saying a hundred percent. Yeah, she was like, "You, you uh, say a hundred percent all the time." Now. Well, I guess like a thousand percent is slightly better than me saying hundo. <laughs> but I, but here's the thing. This is why I really, first of all. I so appreciate your festival. When I found out about your festival, I was doing kind of my my second wave of submissions of possessions. I read about your festival and I was like, I cannot believe this festival exists. And, and I cannot believe that I made a film that is not only a found footage film, and that's not, not, only, not only a faux documentary, it's also a found footage film and a horror film and a personal documentary film. Like I take... Every single friggin' <laughs> box in this festival. <laughs> like, it's so crazy. How does this, how do these people exist? And how did I make, th- and then I thought to myself, after I submitted, I was like, oh, now, what, what if they like, don't take my film because it's not good enough at like any of those things. <laughs> you know, that is a problem that I think we all deal with as programmers, where we get a lot of people who are like, you know, there's not really, the perfect platform for what I made and people don't mostly get it, but you guys will. And it's like, well, we can't take everything. I will tell you possessions, which is not actually called possessions too. Yeah. By the way, Zeke, (laughs) I don't know how that happened. We will get to that. that. (laughs) Yeah. No, your film, you nailed it. And I think, Oh man. Okay. So the horror community, they, they don't give a shit about found footage and a lot of them go out of their way to kind of shit on it. It's kind of like regular critics with horror films in general. So we we are kind of doing like criterion level. Hey, when we show it, this it means it's worth something. But we also realize how lame that shit is. And we have to be self-deprecating. So we love a, a balance of the format is here. This is a great example of like what the Blair Witch kind of kicked off culturally. But we also love it when it's self-deprecating and funny. And not too serious. And on like d- possessions could be like our flagship short. It, you nailed it in all categories. Well, this is what I was hoping when I found your festival. I was like, I have, again, back to my like ridiculous self-indulgent egomania. <laughs> I literally was, as soon as I hit submit, I was like, I have the perfect film for them. Like this is this is their ideal film. I am their ideal filmmaker. Like they are going to play my film. Like I literally that went through my head. But I have to say back to your question or statement about you guys being involved and like being so front and center. I thought it was wonderful, and not just because you guys are great and you love me and you love my work. And all this, <laughs> but like, but because like it is transparent. Like so many of these film festivals, like. There are all these people behind the scenes and I'm not like, like whatever, like, I don't care. Like if like my film gets in or doesn't get into film festivals, like I'm so like, I, I have helped program film festivals before. I know that there are a million reasons why a programmer can, can't take a film, will, won't like all kinds of the discussions that go into it. I, I understand. Like, I totally understand when my films don't get programmed, but What I loved about your festival is that you were there, you were the face, the actual programmers were like standing behind the work that they had chosen. And you could tell by your personalities, the real ones and the fake ones put on (laughs) that like that, like who you are and why you chose the films that you chose. And that kind of transparency just makes the whole idea that there are gatekeepers so much more comfortable. Like knowing who the gatekeepers are, knowing their personalities, knowing their tastes, knowing what they're putting out into the world and why makes it so much more comfortable when like you don't get chosen for something because it's like, oh, well, of course, like, no, I'm just not right for them or like they're not right for me or it just just doesn't make sense. Um, So I really have to say, I really appreciate what you did. And I understand that you're probably going to go back to in-person a screening next year, but I encourage you to to do a hybrid with that many festivals are going to continue to do because I thought it was delightful. So man, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but thank, thanks so much, Zeke. Uh, but I mean, yeah, definitely, it's something that we're thinking about because you know, like you said, a lot of festivals are going, you know, with a streaming, uh, at least supplemental. So, um, Mm -hmm. you know, it's something to think about, but, um, you know, ultimately though, we, we started this festival because these films don't get to play in the theater. So that was why we started this whole found footage thing so that, you know, 
uh, movies filmed on a phone, we can show on a big screen. So yeah. uh, ultimately, we, we want to get back to that. But, you know, uh, the maiden voyage with the uh, live stream per- went pretty well. Yeah. And that was, uh, it, you know, strongly based upon, you know, having talented people like yourself involved with the fest. And it was a lot of fun being able to. So I think I am the only person that stayed awake for the whole stream. And Zeke, you know, I was teasing you earlier. I, I didn't expect anybody, honestly, to even attempt it. Because you wanted to win, you well, dick. No, I, I wanted to do, I wanted to have my cake and eat it too. And I knew our programming. Why is, have a cake? Our pro, okay, we're already doing found footage. Like it's already like the narrative is challenging for people in a way that they won't even show up. So then when we're programming shit like, you know, we open with I blame society and then at 3 a.m. we're showing a film that, you know, featured cartel videos that we've redacted. I knew (laughs) that like we couldn't just have these on demand next to each other. And we kind of had to like I, I, I like to refer to it as just punish our audience. So, you know, we we put the films in an order. I think we we stacked it in the beginning. And, uh, you know, Possessions was a part of that. And one of my favorite things about this fest, too, all the people are like, wow, there are so many good found footage shorts out there. And, you know, when, when we create the format we did, people don't come in. You know, okay, Zeke, I got to tell you, I was worried when we got your short. And only because we have a film programmer who, um, he knew it. And he's like, oh, I know Possessions. I saw it at blank. And I had a weird, like, internal feeling where I'm like, oh, Zeke's going to be too cool for us. Like, he made a found footage movie that penetrated other platforms. Where normally we, we get a lot of premieres because people don't want to show Murder, Death, Korea down at their film fest. Oh, yeah, no, I totally get that. No, absolutely not. Look, so I come from, you know, kind of the less... Uh, you know, marginalized horror, whatever, um, found footage in the film festival world, right? So I've had films that have, you know, premiered at like Telluride and Sundance and South by Southwest and, you know, Possessions also played like Atlanta and Palm Springs and, you know, some of the kind of like, I guess you call them like A-list in the film festivals or whatever. Um, But like what I loved about having made possessions, usually my films will play like six to 12 festivals, right? Of those kind of, you know, I don't know how to really describe them, but like, like premiere, top <laughs> tier premiere film festivals, which is nice. But with possessions, what I slowly realized and I didn't get right away is having made a genre film, there were so many more opportunities, like you say, to see it on a screen. And so I started sending it to genre festivals, horror festivals, your festival, all kinds of, and it just started, it's, I think it's played like well over 50 festivals at this point. Um, and no, it is too good for no movie screen. Like it is meant to be on any movie screen that will play it. <laughs> now, were you in, did you watch your film when it streamed? Not on your platform, no. I was that was part of my hours that I was working because you gave me a, such a prime time slot. Yeah, I, dang. I, I'll, I'll tell you. you the, thank you. The live chat was. Um, I was actually kind of shocked by how many. I, okay, so we had like what we had like five hundred or what twelve. I can't remember the number, but like clearly anybody who showed up to our fest, they're found footage fans. Like because they didn't. Nobody outside of the Bay Area knew who we were. And nobody knew what your short was. And I'm like, there's a weird disconnect here between like indie film fest and like just the found footage group. And I don't know if that means found footage fans are like state or are are agoraphobic and they're all just at home. They don't go out. But like, it was so cool to show to like reveal your film, which was made for those people to them. Yeah. Like I see to me, I don't really, there are two kinds of, there are two kinds of art to me. It, it, art is either brilliant or it's bad. Like there's nothing in between. And like the audience for me is what I, what I aspire to is making films that are unique outside of the box, but totally accessible and, and structured and and perfectly structured. That's like what I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make things that feel organic and um and 
surprising and yet totally inevitable. Sure. Um, and the fact that like that can straddle, you know, like the whole spectrum of film festivals with this one film that I made to me is really the, I mean, it's one of my greatest achievements making this short film. Like, and you know, I've done a lot of things I'm very proud of, but I am so proud to be able to play your festival and like Atlanta film festival and get like extra screenings at Atlanta. You know what I mean? I'm so proud to be able to have one film that does both Um, because the best, like the best things like that are, are like that to me. Like for instance, like my favorite like TV right now is like pen 15, right. Which is a hit on Hulu, but it's also like an experimental like student film, like for half of the episodes, like, um, or like search party, like, you know, like weird experimental like ideas, but totally like accessible television. Now, are you a fan of the, like, kind of shirking um, the traditional studio format? Like, are you a fan of the craft? You mean the of, like, film filmmaking? Of the like, like what, what, what attracted you to found footage horror? Oh, well, no. Nothing attracted me to found footage horror. <laughs> well, let me, let me, let's talk about possessions. Let, let me tell you a little bit about what possessions is and how it came to be. Um, Possessions is not, in my mind, a fiction film. I know it's weird to say, but to me, Possessions is a documentary about myself. So in that sense, it ticked one of your boxes uh, for your festival. And I started out to make, I was selling everything. I was incredibly depressed. I couldn't get out of bed. I was... uh, all of that is absolutely true. And I just decided that I was going to sell everything that I owned because like, it it was like weighing me down. This was before Marie Kondo hit and I (laughs) was going to, and my friend Erica had just bought a camera. She got a a Canon like four, six D something like you would never think to shoot a film on. And she was like, I want to learn how to like shoot with it, like video, I was like, well, why don't you come over? I want to make this documentary about, I'm selling all my things and I want to put the put them out. Uh, I want to sell them. I want to sell everything for a dollar. And I want to do this art project where I follow them on the internet. So the one, the rule is if you buy something that's useless to me, it, there are three rules, useless, you know, if it's art, I keep it. If it's useless, you know, it's a dollar. Um, and you have to, if you buy it, you have to take a picture of it and you have to put it on social media. And the, the whole plan was to do this art project where I was going to follow my possessions through the world as they traveled through social media and I would see where they would end up. Okay, well, <laughs> that was a really bad idea for a documentary, as it turned out. So when I, as I was going through my things, which I had Erica come over every Tuesday, it was like Tuesdays with Maury, except with Zeke, and she would just film me for like, hours like going through all of my shit and just talking about it and then i had the yard sale but right before i I had the yard sale i was like this is such a bad movie that we're making (laughs) i was like what and then it just struck me it was like oh shit no this is there has to be this has to be something else and then i was like oh my god it's it's a, a horror film and then i was like but like what horror film is it and i was like oh it's a a possessions horror film And then I was going through my stuff the next day and I found my piece of the Berlin wall while I was going through my stuff. And I was like, Oh my God. Oh my God. (laughs) I hate it when it's Nazis. Like when I'm watching a movie and the bad guys are Nazis, it's like, I hate it. That's like, I'm allergic to like, like girl with a dragon tattoo is like my worst nightmare. I'm like, Oh my God. (laughs) Nazis again, Nazis. I was like, ugh. but I found my piece of the Berlin wall. And I was like, I understand. Uh, it's not Nazis. Sorry. So then I wrote, so Christine is like, you know, my super good friend. She's a brilliant actress. If you haven't watched um, Hello Ladies on HBO, you should all stream it. She's the. She's I, the I love that show. I love Christine in it. And when I saw her in this film, I got very excited. 
She is the best actress in the whole entire world. I love her. All of my actors are the best act- actors in the world. My Kristen Slaysman, who's in all my movies, uh, my friend uh, Carrie Saffron, uh, Grant Sibley, uh, Sarah Butler, Bill Dawes. Like I, I, I am so blessed to have such brilliant, uh, uh, Carrie Barker, my friend, who's in Megan Shift with me. Like I just have uh, my, Tess Niedermeyer. I have these, these friends who are just brilliant. You got to have a good team, man. And I surround myself with them to like, kind of make me work anyway so what happened with your one friend uh zoe de chanel <laughs> zeke do we lose you there so that's what we call the zeke pause oh, nice. <laughs> it goes on just like a little too long to be comfortable that's good and then um and then it gets uncomfortable and then everybody's like what what happened to the Zoe Deschanel? Well, that is a true story that I tell in Possessions. I'll, okay, so this is my point about Possessions. It's like I was making a documentary about myself, and what I realized is I am a fiction film writer. So it is impossible for me to like make a film about myself that does not become my imaginative creation. So spoiler alerts to people who haven't seen Possessions. You'll find out about 11 minutes in. Um so it, it it started, and I'm also a documentary filmmaker. I've I made two documentaries with Samantha Buck, who's just this brilliant director, writer, actress, everything. Um, and so I had this experience making documentaries, and I'm a, mostly a fiction writer. And I was like, oh, I'm making a documentary about myself, and I am a fiction writer. So that means that I the documentary has to become what my fantasy of the fiction of this film would be. And what is that? Oh, it's a horror movie. It's a possessions horror movie. So then I just wrote the second half of the movie. I had the yard sale. Christine was the only person who at the yard sale who knew that it was a fiction. Everybody else was just coming to my yard sale. Oh, wow. Like that was all just my friends showing up to buy my shit. Um, none of them knew I was making a fiction film. Uh, I mean, maybe they suspected cause it's me, but um then, How did people react when they saw they were on camera? Oh, well, they're like, they're all my friends. They're all like actors and things. And anyway, so like, you know, I invited them. I said, I'm making a documentary about selling all of my things and I'm having my yard sale. Everything's a dollar. I, I put it all out on social media. I said, just show up and come and buy my shit. So it really was made like a documentary. Like, absolutely. It was, it is the first half is not scripted except in the sense that like, it's me, it's about me. So really what I'm asking is like, can you, if you are both the subject and the author, like how can you, what is the difference between truth and fiction? Right? Like that's what possessions is asking. Is there, if, if I'm subject and author, can I tell the truth? And that's why the twist is inevitable in possessions because there comes a point where the truth is so tenuous that it can no longer exist. And then it has to drive toward the most crazy and ridiculous fiction possible, which is why Nazis. (laughs) (laughs) And so to me, I want at the end of possessions for, for people to think back to the first moment of possessions and be like, how did we get from there to here in just 17 and a half minutes? How did that happen? How did I go from like watching the first 30 seconds, which was this like navel gazing documentary about a depressed person in Hollywood, like selling his things to like the person like, like in a, a horror film, like whose friend is like possessed by a Nazi. Like, how did that happen? How did I go from one to the other? And hopefully it happens so imperceptibly that like you marvel at that. And that is the fun of watching. That's the hope. Zeke, um, I have to tell you, you nailed it. Um, the craft is there. You don't, it's not a surprise because from the very beginning, there are hints, there's, <laughs> there's a breadcrumb crumb trail of we're going to horror. I mean, we open up and the first thing you say is like, this is my nightmare. That's right. Like, if you don't know it's a horror film, of course, I tell you everything. I tell you everything you need to know the whole way through. My possessions are staring down at me like demons. I mean, I tell you everything. Now, are, now, so are you a found footage horror fan? Like, what is your experience with that subgenre of horror? I mean, I've seen, I saw the Blair Witch Project in the movie theater when it came out. 
which I liked. I saw, you know, paranormal act. I mean, I, I don't have like a deep understanding of it, a deep knowledge no. of it. A deep, I don't sadly. Like, I, I'm I, shocked. I'm shocked because you, you nailed some things that a lot of directors and writers really struggle with. And there's, there's a transition point in your movie where, um, we're doing the documentary and you have all your friends over. And again, you're incredibly funny. And I think the camera loves you and you're, you. you're entertaining to watch. And you know, you with the Sarah Palin doll, like all of this shit, it just works. And we're already, we're kind of hooked. And it's like, well, if this turns out not to be a horror movie, that, that would make sense too. We don't just show horror at our film fest yet. There's a point where the, the film has a switch and you're going from a dude who's very knowledgeable about art and you're very self-aware in your approach. Like, I think you have like a yellow hoodie that's sleeveless and you're wearing mm -hmm. that. And there's a transition to you in a uh, macho man tank top and we're at night. And this is the first time where we're dealing with like phone footage. Yeah. And that transition is so natural yet you confront the format. Like we go from like, almost like a, um, S town, highly produced product to a, Hey, this moment happened. And you, we can imagine, you know, somebody's like, Hey, turn on the camera. Like this is a little weird. And the film, we just spiral from there. And I mean, everything like you, you're talking about the, uh, the Nazi element. I honestly thought you were making a statement on symbolism because, you know, in a lot of possession films, we deal with, um, you know, we're, we're confronting Christianity and the most hack fucking thing you can do to say the devil's in your house is to just turn your cross upside down. And, you know, the origin of that cross is St. Peter. It's not satanic in any right, yet cultures kind of put it on there. And when we have the lipstick swastika show up in the bathroom, I don't know if you did it on purpose. I thought you did. You, you drew it, it. It went the way of the Buddhist. Like, it's not the way Hitler used it. And, and it's almost like if you're not, if you don't know symbolism, it still works because Nazis are the villain everywhere. Yeah. But I'm like, did they do that on purpose? Like, like is somebody being possessed, but not fully? And, and again, you don't have to answer any of this because the thing that I was sure you were a huge found footage fan, and I, I made point to reference this in the chat when we were live streaming, is you have footage of you digging a grave. Now... If um, found footage is stigmatized all the time, I mentioned that earlier. And there's this, I, again, everybody listening, I apologize. I know I talk about this a lot. Michael Goy, he was the head of a cinematographer's guild. He made a movie called Megan is Missing, which uh, he wanted to really confront audiences and, and make them aware of like child abduction. And he ends his film with a like 15 minute long shot of a grave being dug. Yet we don't really get to see a lot. You just, it's kind of there to leave a mark. Like he's burying these girls. Now there's echoes of that in uh, the film Creep, which is kind of a self-aware comedy. And in that movie, we zoom out from footage of somebody digging a grave that's made to imply to the audience that the lead has been buried. Yet we zoom out and it's the guy who was making the film. And he's like, I don't know why he sent me footage of him digging a grave. And then he go, walks through it. He's like, maybe it's to imply that he's burying me. I don't know. It's really weird. So when I saw that in your film, I'm like, fucking Zeke gets found footage horror. Like, I was sure you were going to come in here and just be some, like, DL found footage genius. Zeke, I, well, I apologize. This is the part of the show where <laughs> Russell gets swallowed up in his own vortex of monologue. No, Extra no. Extrapolate what you can out of that. <laughs> I find, no, I find all of that like so fascinating. Okay, so I have a few things, may I respond? I have a few a few things yeah, to yeah. say. Yeah, the floor. That is, that is brilliant and I, I plan on going and I, I would love it if you would send me, if you would send me a list of 10 found footage <laughs> projects that I could go find and watch, I will educate myself. I would love to, love to know more about it. Um, here's the thing. Back to your question about the craft. I am a crafts person. Like I, to me, like I'm a structuralist, because I have such a wild, unreined imagination in some ways that like being a structuralist really helps me kind of um, use my imagination. So if I, if I have kind of boxes to stay inside, then I can figure out how to go outside of them. But if I have no boxes, then like it's just like this amorphous 
So yes, I am I am totally a craftsperson. So I think maybe what you're seeing in my work is a result of like my very hard worked um you know attention to the craft of making this film. Like there is never a moment in a screenplay of mine or a film of mine that is not accounted for. Like there, like everything, everything has a purpose or it must go. I, I adhere to Kurt Vonnegut's rules of writing. I think it's his rule number six or seven. It's like, if a sentence does not either move the story forward or reveal character, it must be cut. And I feel the exact same way about film. If like, there's like nothing drives me more crazy than if I'm watching a TV show and like, like it, the scene starts and like someone comes in and it's like, hello, how are, how are you doing? I'm like, well, no, like well, that does not reveal character or plot. <laughs> like, like it must be cut. Like it may not be, in what I'm watching, like the, the editor in my head, it drives me crazy. Even in, I'll have a conversation with people and I'll be like, why are you saying that? Like that is not revealing anything about you or this conversation. Like it must be cut. Like, <laughs> like stop talking. Um, anyway, the pandemic was tough. Um, so, so to me, the things that you're mentioning are all very like, okay, so the lipstick on the mirror was like, well, I do need a symbol that is going to be kind of a clue or foreshadowing as obvious as it is to what's to come. Now, I did not draw a Nazi symbol in the Buddhist way. I just drew it the way my mind remembered a Nazi symbol looks on the mirror with my friend's lipstick, literally in like 20 seconds because we were about to like get the shot. So it was not purposeful. Um, But I, I, I do think that whenever you do something with intention, that's when people can look and find whatever symbolism to them is in it. And if it had no intention, then people can't find symbolism in it, their own purposeful or unpurposeful because it had no intention. Um, so that's, that's what I think kind of, you know, of, you know, other people's analysis of any, any work is like the symbolism is there and that's what we kind of project onto things, but it's only there because it was, because whether or not the reason is the same, it was put there with intention because it has to be intentional or why use it? Like everything is intentional in possessions. There is, and to give huge credit to my editor, Ryan Buckley, who came on board, I did the rough cut. I did the first cut of the film, which I am proud to say was only 21 minutes. Um, And, but I knew I needed a real editor, a real expert to come in. And I found, I through my friend Mark Winters, who I love deeply, he was doing some assisting editing work at the time for this guy, Ryan Buckley. And he was like, I love this. Let me give it to Ryan, see if he's interested. Ryan came in and he did all post-production with me. He like edited many, we did like maybe four cuts, not crazy, but like, and then he like worked on the sound with Michael Cross and he did all the temp music that then um, Steve Matthew Carter, the composed this incredible score. Christine and I and Steve wrote the song, the final song, which by the way, Christine sings. So it's like all of these things are so intentional and people never think they are. And that's kind of the point. I tried to um, Shazam that song. Is it available? I can send you the song, but no, it's not available because Christine and Steve and I wrote it. I want it. <laughs> um, I love yeah, it. possessions. It was fun. Oh, and the way that came to be is like there. Okay, so um, Emily, what's her name? She's the Canadian singer. She says the song about like um, the things you own, they own you. She's like this indie rocker and from Canada. She's like famous. She's in one of those famous Canadian indie rock bands. Rain anyway, in your territory. I know. <laughs> Anyway, she's like, to like snobby music people, they're going to know who she is. I really wanted to use her song at the end of my movie because literally the lyric is the things that you, the things you own, they own you. It was like perfect. So I emailed her through her website and like the email got to her managers and like we were in conversation and they were like, well, we, you know, we want to see the movie and how you would place it. And I had a rough cut at the time. So I sent it with the song placed in. They emailed me back the nastiest Ooh, rejection. What? Like, Whoa. how dare you even think that we would consider placing our client's song in your movie? This is so bad, whatever. So I was like, well, fuck you. I'm going to write a song. So wait, I wrote the lyrics. wait, that really happened? Yeah. What? I what? mean, I'm I'm shocked because I, 
I constantly feel like the shit we put out is not great and we're lame and nobody should listen to the show. And yet, you know, we reach out for screeners all the time. And that's always like my fear is that somebody's just going to see through the shit and reach back out and be like, hey, fuck you. How dare you? Except, dude, doing this for years, never, never once. And I've learned most people just won't respond. Yeah. This is the first time I've ever heard of somebody coming back out with like a nasty email. Was it the not? Oh, it was, it was nasty. I, I couldn't actually believe it. <laughs> I was like, wow, like you are so mean. <laughs> um, it was really, it was really mean. So I was just like, okay, um, fine. I won't use your song in my movie, but I had written lyrics to a musical before. I was like, whatever. I know what I want. I want the song to be about and say. And then Steve, who was writing my score, I just sent him, literally I sent him the lyrics and maybe half an hour later, he sent me, uh, not the produced song, but like, you know, the music with the lyric, he was singing the lyrics. And then I had Christine sing it. And Christine's um, fiance is a, um, a wonderful uh, Hollywood composer. And so I had him... Um, uh, record her at his home studio and we just mixed it in a day and it was done. And so, so that's like my message to, you know, aspirants out there who like think making a movie is impossible. Do it yourself, do everything yourself. You can all, you can, there's nothing you can't do. Like, like me, Steve and Christine can like make a song happen. Like be your own gatekeeper, be your own gatekeeper. Like don't let anybody tell you like, you know, fuck them. Fuck anyone who says no. Like, whatever. It doesn't matter. Agreed. That was beautiful. Do it yourself. Yeah. Do it yourself. Zeke, I have to, I have to point out that, um, you know, the beginning of your short, it, it talks about how there are rules in art that are meant to be broken. And mm. then, <laughs> then you go into Kurt Vonnegut's rules. And I'm curious, did you set up parameters for making the film? Like, I don't want to do too much improv or anything. And then found yourself in the moment, like breaking rules. I, no. Yes and no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's the thing is like, there have to be rules to learn technique, but then once you have your technique to make art, you have to break the rules. Right. So like, you can't just like go break every rule because like you're an artist, you have to like, <laughs> you have to, you have to learn like, like Picasso, like his technique is like masterful, but then he like breaks it all to like be an artist. Right. Yeah. So you can't, you can't not learn rules before you break them, I guess. You have to at least know what the rules are. But that is the point of possessions is like, like I tell you, yes, the, first you make the rules and then you break them. And that's exactly what possessions is. Like in a sentence, you make the rules. I am making a documentary. And then you break it. Zeke, uh, you have inspired me because what happened this week is that we got an ordinance from the city of San Bruno where we live <laughs> because I've been smoking on the back porch for months. And now I've learned out that there's a Sydney ordinance that I can't smoke in a townhouse in the city of San Bruno. So now, what? now that I know the rule, I'm going to continue to break it now. Is that? Well, I, I mean, I don't know <laughs> about life, but... Oh, well. Also, that's not a joke. He was very angry all week about the ordinance that appeared on our front door. I took away my six, six o'clock joint, man. <laughs> <sighs> it was a very important part of the day. No, and Zeke, I, I thought it was important to bring that up because found footage is, it's weird. It's a genre that's created by parameters, essentially rules. And it's a lot like, I, I used to love comparing it to the Dogma 95 movement. Although I found a lot of people in the found footage genre didn't really get it. Yeah. But the way that your film opened up, it really demanded like, okay, of me, of a person who watches far too much found footage horror to pay attention to your rules. And the thing is they, they tracked for, they track for most of your film. And then at the very end, they're broken. But by the very end, it's like they needed to be. Because I think we get a BGM at the end, but like once we hit that transition, what, what, what's a BGM? The background, background music. music, yeah. So, oh. so you you move from that like highly produced into we're driving over in a car and you're questioning your your camera person who is now a part of the movie, which already it feels like we're we're deconstructing, yet you're still in the parameter of found footage, and then as we move through that third act, then we start breaking found footage rules, and 
You're totally right. And I think it's important for, you know, the people who spent a decade trying to point out what the Blair Witch did wrong and how it's not real to like really embrace that and just learn like, you know, sometimes breaking the rules will just strengthen the product and definitely the art. Well, something Possessions was also doing is that, you know, film has to have movement and like many, not just, uh, you know, uh, image movement, but it has to have movement in all kinds of ways. But it's moving toward formalist filmmaking to, as you say, completely kind of off the cuff, kind of found footagey. Like, how did this footage come to be? Like, and and coming up with the justification for like why Erica like has the camera in the car while we're going to film she just brings her camera everywhere and we're making a documentary. So that footage feels like less formalist and it stops being edited in a formalist way. So it's going from formalist to, to um, I guess, real, more real life feeling as the story is going from real life to fiction. So there are opposite arcs happening. Visually, it's going and structurally, it's going from formalist to completely informal and and in terms of fiction versus truth, it's going from truthful to fiction. So as the film starts looking and feeling more real, what's actually the story is becoming more and more fictional. Does that make sense? So they're going in opposite directions. Uh, No, it completely does. And I will tell you that I submitted possessions to several documentary film festivals because I truly, really, and this is not a joke, I really do believe it's a documentary. I do believe that it is a, an examination of truth and fiction by the subject. And I'm the subject and I'm the filmmaker and it's about me. There's nothing about it that isn't me. It's about me as a depressed person and it's about me as a filmmaker. But no documentary film f- festival agreed with that. And that's yeah. weird because I feel like you could make an argument that I, I imagine anybody programming for a documentary film fest would be like, we only want to show, you know, um, direct cinema or like you can't be performing for the camera. And then that would quickly go into the argument of, well, everybody's performing in front of a camera. There's no truth here. And Michael right. made a living of documentaries and. <laughs> Michael Moore, there you go. <laughs> but also, like, lots of documentaries have, like, um, recreated scenes in them. Like, sure. you know, Oscar-winning ones. The one about the guy who did the tightrope across the World Trade Center. Like, you see all this footage of, like, that was recreated. That, like, of, you know, of him practicing. And it's not him. It's like they shot that footage. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why when you brand a movie documentary, it's like it has to come with the weight of being like serious art or almost kind of like a reference for fact. Like there's no like wiggle room there, which is completely hypocritical. If you ever like study the format, because it's all manipulation. Every course, course, yeah. notion, as soon as you write something, as soon as you structure something, as soon as you edit something, it is written and therefore it is fictional. That's that's the side I come down. There's no such thing as nonfiction. As soon as somebody, somebody writes something, even if it's facts written down, it is fiction. Like it's somebody's story. Somebody is telling that story. Do you know what drove me crazy? The whole thing with James Fry and Oprah. Over it was a thousand little pieces. A million little day. pieces, yeah. A million little pieces. Like what like what memoir isn't fiction? Like, I don't get it. Like and why Oprah like had such a, a beef with him. Yes, he's an asshole, but like, but so what? Like his publisher was like, we need to like market it this way. Like, and he's like, okay, well, it's sort of based on my real life. Like all fiction is. Yeah. Like, who cares? <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> I don't know. Damn that you, Oprah. <laughs> it really bothered me. I mean, he made a gazillion dollars because of it, because everybody then rebought his book, reread his book and whatever. And I guess she sort of semi apologized, but like talk about an egomaniac. Um, God, she's not going to apologize for anything. Well, she's got Meg and Marco now, so she's, she's doing okay. <laughs> you guys want to hear an excerpt from the email I got rejecting the song, my use of the oh, song? Oh, please, please. I, I just found it and I have no shame. <laughs> Okay, so the beginning is not quite as, as you know, acerbic as it was in my memory. First of all, it's Emily Haynes. That's her name for all you listeners who were screaming at the podcast. It's Emily Haynes! <laughs> this sentence is the sentence that st- stood out to me. That 
the question, okay, so they basically say, we see how it relates, the song relates to your film, but, you know, um, we do not feel that this placement works for the song master. The question of fees has not arisen, but I can assure you that our publisher would quote a substantial sum. However, I do not feel it would be useful to even pursue that line of approach. Whoa. Hopefully you can find a suitable solution to your music problems. What a dick. Wow. That's crazy. Like somebody's manager wrote that to me. That's so (laughs) gross. Gross. Oh my so I said, so, but you know what? The song that we wrote is so much better and more perfect for this film than Fatal Gift, which you should probably just like play as like the out music on your podcast. Just, <laughs> why don't you steal it and play it on your podcast? Oh, done. <laughs> okay, so it's called The Fatal Gift. It's by Emily Haynes. It's actually a fantastic song and you'll see why. Um, Randy, lay it in post. We lay it. There you go. Um, did, see, did you know Randy's here? He's our engineer, Randy. You can- Randy, thank you for hooking this up. Thank you to the engineers of the world. <laughs> oh my God. Sound people make movies. Sound people are everything. My sound person, Michael, Michael Cross, who's done sound on six or seven of my films. He's the most, he's like the most important. What an unsung hero. Um, so singing your praises, Michael Cross, if you listen to this. Yeah, we hate Randy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> Sound is everything in a movie. Randy, like, now, oh, you, wait, hold on. You can, I, I, I got to jump in here for Randy. Now, he did mention Roma in uh, this short. Uh-huh. Did you want to go ahead and talk about uh, your boy? Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know. I'm a big fan of uh, Italian neorealism. I appreciated it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. I love it. Italian neorealism is like my favorite period. Hell like, yeah. 20... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Same. I like. Oh, no. The, like the, the bicycle thief? What a freaking amazing movie. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, actually, Italian cinema in general. I mean, La Dolce Vita is my favorite movie. Yeah. Um, Fellini is one of like, my favorites. Which one? Just Fellini in general. Oh, yeah. Fellini. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, and uh, well, well, Swept Away, Lena Vertmuller, 19, like the 70s movie they remade. with. And I blame, I blame the remake of that movie with Madonna for Elizabeth Banks's like, fame. Huh. Um, <laughs> Um, and, cast, and, and my casting director friend Mark Bennett, who cast her in the film. No, I'm just kidding. I love Elizabeth Banks; she's amazing. But like, that's really where she like popped out of the woodwork was in, was in that movie. Um, she's she's incredible. Um, in a remake of Lena Vertmuller's masterpiece, uh, starring Madonna, like directed by Guy Pearce. What a weird movie! <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Um, it's like a feminist ma- masterpiece from the mid seventies directed by Guy Pierce starring his wife, Madonna about her being like abused, like a very weird project. Oh, swept away. Uh, swept away. Yeah. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. Yikes is right. But yeah, Italian cinema is like my favorite. It kind of, the love affair kind of ends for me with cinema Paradiso, which I think is. Just okay. Not- yeah. But, um, I but like before- cinema Paradiso. Yeah, it's okay. It's cute. Um, it's cute, yeah, but it's not. It's not the bicycle thief. It's, it's not. No. It's not. Te, 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 it's no Tea Rama. Tea Rama is my, actually my favorite Italian movie, the Pasolini movie. Tea Um Unfortunately, I think yeah. we're more giallo over here. <laughs> oh, I think that's oh, oh. muscle speed. But I do really think of myself as an Anna Magnani. I do like like when I say these things, I know they come out as like funny. But like, she sold her furniture and made a movie. That's exactly what I was doing with possessions. <laughs> Rome Open City is like a masterpiece and she and Pasolini and uh, Rossellini sold their furniture to make a movie. I think everybody should be willing to sell their couch to make a movie. <laughs> like, Zeke, you know, you just, you prove it. Like every time a film fan or a director or somebody in the art, they kind of veer into horror. Like it's not their like life's goal to be like the next, I don't know, George Romero or something. I feel like those are always the strongest additions to it. And um, I'm so glad that you came into our found footage lane. It was exactly what we needed. Well, thank you for inviting me into your lane by having your film festival. Like it's, I could literally, I could not believe it when I saw that your film festival existed. I was like, wow. Because Possessions had at, the, had at that point, started playing a lot of genre film festivals. And, you know, I have to say they're so welcoming and so awesome. And I've had so much fun at so many genre film festivals. Um, 
and uh, you guys are, you know, a highlight of the stops along the way. And um, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I can't believe somebody made a festival just for <laughs> movies like Possessions. Like, it's crazy. Now, um, Zeke, before we let you go, uh, two things. Uh, we want to know what you're working on now, what we can expect from you in the future. And, but before we get to that, please um, educate me and us. How did I fuck up the Possessions 2 debacle? Get, let's get to the bottom of that. Okay. So here's the thing. Every time, so I had I had a few cuts of possessions that I was sending that you were linked. Uh, you okay for people who do, for people who don't know when you're submitted to film festivals, you create links on Vimeo and then you put that link into Film Freeway, and then Film Freeway is the platform that you use to submit um, the uh, the film to film festivals. Now I had been I had a couple links up of possessions and uh, on Vimeo. And in order to keep track of which version I was using, I added numbers because that seemed like the easiest way. But then, so I knew which link was going to the film festival. I had created, I, I used that in the title that I was sending to film festivals thinking to myself, Oh my God, well, people are going to know that like my film isn't called possessions dash two possessions dash three, whatever, but not just you. <laughs> I was wrong. Many festivals are like, congratulations. Because when a festival says congratulations, they're just like clicking a box and being like accepted. Right. So you get, so I get an email possessions slash two was accepted at this film at the, you know, unnamed, you know, footage film festival. So then the first thing I do usually, and I probably was remiss in your case, is I email and I say, thank you for accepting me. I'm so thrilled to be playing your festival. Just so you know, the actual title of my film is not Possessions Dash 2. I was using that to track cuts and it, I, I kept it on Film Freeway. The actual title of my film is just Possessions, all caps. Um, is somehow that got lost in the translation. <laughs> and then it was Did like, you send me that email? I don't know if I did. I did. I, I honestly have not looked to see if I did. I may have, and it may be your, your, you missed it. I may not have. It may be that I missed it, whatever. But I do think it's hysterical because can you imagine if actually my film had been called Possessions 2? That would have been genius. <laughs> well, um, I mean, literally at UF3, we showed a movie called Dinosaurs 2. And then we get films like Canon 5D Mark III Low Light Test. Or right. know, like in found footage, people play with that format so much. They're doing like the House of Leaves thing. So, it was not intentional. Yeah, Possessions 2, it was like, well, duh. <laughs> <laughs> Which, so I, th I, I mean, I get how it, it all happened and I think it's hysterical and I'm glad it played under... Um, that title for you guys, um, because why not? <laughs> why not? But the poster just says possessions. Um, Touche. Correct. <laughs> no, correct. And um, uh, oh, and by the way, the poster was designed by Erica, who I have not spoken of an enough either. She shot possessions. She's an off off camera actress in possessions. She is. She produced possessions with me. She was there every moment in the making of it with me, and she has such patience humor and like uh, ability to deal with me, my ego and all the frustrations of making a movie with zero crew. The only day I, days I had any crew were the day of the yard sale. My friend Alex Chabot came to do live sound. I had my friend Alex Oliver came to be the AD. I had my friend Josh Tamani came to be like a PA and I had Erica there shooting. And then we also used that same crew the night that we did the horror shoot. But other than that, it was just me and Erica the whole time. And she is such a friggin' trooper. Trooper. Um, in terms of what I'm working on now, I made two shorts since um, Possessions, one of which is on the has been on the festival circuit also this year. It's a much more formalist uh, short. It would have no place at your festival. <laughs> um, but then I made this other short, um, during the pandemic, I went home to stay with my, uh, to be with my parents, to kind of like be with them, help them out during the pandemic. Um, so I was in Florida and I, again, like Anna Magnani, with all of these obstructions to my ability to make a movie, no crew, no professionals, nobody to do things for me because I can't do anything myself. I had to learn to do it all myself. And I shot two shorts starring me and my parents. Um, one of which, 
is done and I will send to you and you can decide whether or not it fits into your, your purview for your festival. Oh, please. It may or it may not. You will see. The second of which I think very much will fit into the purview of your, your festival, but it's not done yet. It hasn't, I haven't edited yet. But I'll tell you, so Mark loves it when the parents make an appearance in a movie. That's <laughs> oh, they are. My parents, yeah. I found out during the pandemic, are brilliant actors. Um, so the first one is called Home Movie, and the second one is Ooh. called They Come Home to Die. <laughs> um, and that one is maybe more, up, well, they're both, I think, up your alley. And then I am, um, you know, I'm in my kind of, I split my time between being a short filmmaker and writing fiction, television and, and film projects. And I, I, you know, did a lot of writing during the pandemic. Um, I have, you know, a feature uh, thriller with woman in jeopardy digital thriller that I'm trying to get made called a film by Vera Vaughn, which you can actually see the short. We did a short proof of concept version of it. It's called, it's on Vimeo. It's uh, it's a uh, short of the week. It's a, uh, a Vimeo staff pick. It's called a film by Vera Vaughn. Everybody can go watch that. You can watch my other shorts that are um, free to watch on Vimeo. Megan Shift and Ride or Die. Um, and Possessions will probably get released into the world for public consumption. I'm guessing by the end of this year, it will be done with its festival run. And then um, you can go watch my um, some of the features that I wrote and produced with their directors. Um, which are Before the Sun Explodes, the stand-up comedy one. Um, two actual documentaries directed by... The, uh, Before the Sun Explodes is directed by Deborah Eisenstadt. And the two documentaries I worked on with Samantha Buck are 21 Below and uh, Best Kept Secret. And you can find those on the internet. I think Best Kept Secret is on Amazon Prime and 21 Below may or may not still be. Um, and then Gaby is a film that I produced with the writer director, um, Jonathan Lisecki, and that's on Hulu. Um, and I don't know what I'm doing. I just got back to Los Angeles from my year abroad in Florida with my parents. And I'm just trying to get settled and figure out what the fuck to do next <laughs> because I, I don't really know. I have to finish this new short and send it to you guys. And that's the only thing on my plate right now. I'm trying to get a friggin' job. That's what I'm trying to do. So if you're hiring somebody <laughs> who just did this podcast, like I did this podcast, just get in touch with the podcast makers and they'll forward your emails to me. Um, and <laughs> I'll take the job. Randy handles all of our personnel <laughs> issues. So Randy, uh, Randy, take it from me. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, are you Randy and Rand, just get in touch with Randy and HR? Yep. Yes, um, and uh, I'm happy to work for a lot of money. <laughs> well, Zeke, thanks so much, man. This was a blast, and uh, man, we were so uh, so honored and, and thrilled to show your film, and uh, it crushed. Uh, the chat was going crazy when Possessions was on, and uh, we were just proud to be a part of it, man. 